is David Lichtenstein, and welcome to the Yeshiva Shalmaila. And we have such an amazing program this week. I'm, I'm proud to be involved with it. And here's the story. This week in Eretz Yisrael, the Bezdin was criticized that what happens, a Russian immigrant comes, blonde, blue-eyed, and they say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm Jewish. My mother told me I'm Jewish, my grandfather. And the Bezdin doesn't know what to do. How do you bring Adem from communist Russia from 50 years ago, when people, Jews were terrified to say who he was. Do you know, is it a Jew, isn't it? So they started doing genetic testing to see. They'll, they'll take a swab from the mouth, they give it to the lab, and they say, this person is 99.8% Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. Well, can you use that to say, Mew Yehudi, is he a Yid or isn't he? Can you resolve Mamza cases? A father says, you know, the, he says, it's not Bani. In he says, it's Eina Bani. Well, can you use... Can a Bezdin take DNA to resolve it? Can a be- right? So we have put together a fabulous thing, and we could never do this. Tell me any time this happened in history, before the Yeshiva Shomayla. We have Rabbi Yeshua Pfeffer, Dain Rav Ashuais, his Bezdin. He's the editor of Tzarachian. He's one of the most cutting-edge Rabbanim when it comes to halacha and, and the thing, how the world is changing. Listen to the guest list he's put together. Rabbi Yehoram Ullman, he's the Reich Bezdin in Sydney, Australia, right? Expert in halacha and genetics. We have Rav Zev Litka, the director of Simonim, an organization to help people with their identity. He's a dying in Rav Ashuais's Bezdin. We've had Rev, Rabbi Dr. Shai Karmi, he's the Israeli expert on genetics, professor in Hebrew University as well as a Rav. And from Poland, Rabbi Michal Sudridge, the chief rabbi of Poland. Why is he an expert in genetics? What would happen? The, tra- the Nazis come into town. They start hurting everybody. A mother would run over to their Gaish neighbor who they were friendly with. Some, maybe somebody who helped in the house. Maybe some, and they would say, take my child. He has blue eyes. Tell them he's yours. Well, they died in Treblinka, Auschwitz, Maidanek, or one of the other hundred um, um, killing fields that the, uh, the Nazis Yamach Shimam did. And this child grows up, and he knows he doesn't look like his siblings. You know, I saw a letter from somebody, a very sad letter he wrote that was printed on the Internet. I saw this years ago. He said, you know, I grew up in a family. I don't look like them. My mother died. I don't know who, if I'm really the child, but I know one thing. One brother is a carpenter. One is a plumber. One drives a truck here in Poland. And I had never interest. I was always the A student in my class. Today I'm the, I became a physician. I'm the top doctor in my hospital. And I suspect I'm really Jewish. Some mother gay came and gave me away. Well, can you use genetics to identify this person? So when before Yeshiva Shalmaila did you ever hear a program where you have experts from four continents speaking about this topic? It's never been done before in Kval Yisrael. What a fabulous program. Before we go to our guests, I want to make an, uh, you know, I don't usually take, we don't usually do advertisements here, but this time I'm going to do an advertisement. There's an amazing new safe out. It's coming to America soon. It's on the Mishnah Bura. It's called Mishnah Achreina. And what is it? The Mishnah Achreina is some on Shilcha Shabbos. is amazing. It's two volumes. And it has every imaginable Halacha from Shabbos that has happened since the Mishnah Bura was written 140 years ago. And boy, has the world changed. There was no electricity. There were no cleaning ovens. The floors were made out of dirt in the times. And he writes how you, you sweep. It's a guma, ashvi guma, right? Everything has changed. Halacha Shabbos has changed. So we did have, till now, we had the Shmir Shabbos Kilchasa. But it's not, it, Shmir Shabbos Kilchasa is like a box score. It tells you what halacha is, no questions, boom. This is an unusual sefer. It's on the Mishnah Bura. It has a mafteach that will point you to any possible halacha in Hilcha Shabbos. You just open it up. It's cross-referenced. But when you go there, not only is the Mishnah Achrayin on top, does it tell you what the sikum of the paiskim is, but here's where it gets wonderful. On the bottom is the beer, where it explains what the debate is. So when you look at it, it's not like Xeris HaKosov, it's the paraduma, you have to do this. Oh, this is the reason for that. And then already you could say, you know, if you're a Talmud Chacham, you learned you're a Ben Tyre, which almost everybody today, oh, this, I understand this logic, I understand this. Well, here it's Negea for me. Here it's not Negea for me. I mean, just starting in Seminal of washing clothes out of Shabbos, can you? You're not allowed to. Bottom it says, well, if you, have a, if you have a washing machine today, it could be di-. all the debate. So it's one of a kind. 
It, there were 12,000 copies printed right now before Pesach. 6,000 were snapped up by the top koilim in the world. 2,000 will be sent to America. There will be around two or 3,000 sold in Eretz Yisrael, 1,000 in other places in the world. It's not going to last long. I suggest that you grab it. I'm a little bit of an Egea Bedover. I was, you know, the editor of it. So if you enjoy our debates and our discussions, buy the Mishnah Achrayin on Hilcha Shabbos coming to America soon. I want to say over a vart on the par- on the uh, we're coming up to the Haggadah, and I want to say a short vart because this is a fantastic program and I don't want to take away from it. But you know, we're about to read the Haggadah. When do we say Baruch Hamakayim Baruch Hu Shenas entirely Ami Yisrael Kenegad Arba Banim? What a strange Russian Baruch Hamakayim. I mean, we have. You know, we, every time, when we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, we use the Shem Hashem, we use sometimes, we have the Shem Adnos, we have Kim, Kenu, we have, he's called Kel Shakai. <coughs> what a strange appellation, Baruch HaMaka, and what's shot in it? So let me suggest a possible answer. Where's the first time that you see the Rabbani Shalem, God is called Makaim, in the Torah? And we have a Kabbalah, both from the Holy the, the Vilna Goyen, as well as the Baal Shem Tev, that the first time something appears in the Torah is Megala and what it is. The first time is Vayiska Bamaka in Vayola and Shem. Yaakov Avinu is running away from his home. Right? Esav, Achiv, Misnachim, Olav, Lahargecha. Right? What did Esav say? Ahargo is Yaakov Achi. So Rakiv had to run away to where? To Bais Lavan Harami. And what is he called? He's called Vayiska Bamaka. He bumps into God. He meets God. He meets the Rabbi Nishalem. And Chazal say, Rav Huna B'Shem Rav Ame. Why is the Rabbi Nishalem called Makayim? Shu Makayim Shalaylam. Why over there? Think of it. You've had tough times. I've had tough times too. But Yaakov Avinu is running for his life. Ahargas Yaakov Achi. So where does he say, Go, there's only one safe haven I know. She didn't have a big mishpacha. Yaakov Yitzchak wasn't going to send him to Yishmael. So Rivka says, I have a son, he, a brother, Lavan Harami. Yaakov knew Lavan was a bad guy. When he meets him, he, he meets the shepherds, he says, Achi, Kachi, Achi, Chahu. So Rashi says, Achivani Baramais. Yaakov Ishtam is going to Lavan the fraudster. So wait a minute, wait a minute. Yaakov has in his pocket maybe diamonds. He knows how to deal with a fraudster. Makaif them up. But that's not the case. Eliphaz comes along the way. And he tries to kill Yaakov. Yaakov gives him all the money. He tells him, So Yaakov is endangered. His life is threatened. He's homeless. And he's impoverished. He has no money. And what happens then? He meets the Makayim Shalom. What's the Russian? You have no place. You have no money. You have no home. They're threatening you. They want to kill you. You know what? By me, the Kavayach says, I always have a Makayim for you. In my heart, Rabbi Nisholm says, I am the Mekai Mishalem. Run to me. Flee to me. You will always find shelter in me. Where's another time we find Makaim? When we find Naman is a Mitzayra. And it says, the Mitzayra, Heinif Yada El Hamakaim. He lifts his hand to daven to God. El Hamakaim. So what does Chazal say on it? Who Mekai Mishalem? Again, what is the Mitzayra? We don't know what it is. It's just a figurative Lushan in the Tyra. But what is the Mitzayra? The Mitzayra is the leper. People were terrified. Their limbs would fall off. It's before modern medicine. You go near this person, you could die. So what did they do? They became an outcast. Imagine the loneliness, the isolation, the terror of the Mitzayra. He has no place. People don't want to come within a hundred feet of him. And what does he say? He was menhenif yadei el hamakayim. But you, he says, even a deformed person, a handicapped person, somebody who feels that society shuns them. You know, my wife works with Aleph. Aleph is an organization run by malachim. I know, if you want to see a malach, you should see Rabbi Bayarsky from Aleph. The families of prisoners, people who, and you know, how a society is, unfortunately, we're a very clicky society, very covered, shaduchim. Somebody's parent goes to jail. The child suffers terribly. The spouse suffers terribly. 
right? They become sirens to our society. Un, 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 incorrectly, sadly, what does it say? Vayif, what does it say? Heinef yad elamakim. You should know, my child, the rabbinu shleilam. If you are lonely, embarrassed, outcast, the rabbinu shleilam has a makim in his heart, in his hands for you, right? What else does it say? It says. What's the big? People have losses in their lives, and they feel like the rug has been pulled out from under them. Right? When, when it could be a financial loss, a bankruptcy, it could be, it could be. What's the biggest loss a person has? Death. The, the tummy mace is the biggest, the, the biggest trauma, the biggest sense of loss. It's terrifying. When somebody loses a parent, I remember when I lost my father. The sense of the void, the terror. Right? God forbid somebody loses a sibling. A spouse, another may sell the ishtai, anisha may sell the baila. Rahmanullah people lose a child. They feel that the world is collapsing on them. The ground under them has turned into quicksand. What should we say? Hamakaim Yanachim Eschem. You feel like the the floor has been pulled out? There is always a makrim. The Rabbi Nishom always has a makrim for you. Hamakrim yinachim eschem. Hashem tzilcha al yad yuminecha. He's right next to you. It says, Ma'ayna aleikai mikedem. Up in the heavenly spheres is aleikai mikedem. Umitachas. Down here, Zrayais Eilam. The Rabbi Nishom's arms surround the world. What does that mean? In case you feel sometimes like you're falling off, one of your children is falling off the world. He's Mekai Meshalelam. His arms will catch you. So what happens? The time of the Haggadah is here. Sel la Beisavai. Sel la Bayis. The great family meal. The time we got la Bincha. We put our hands on our children. We bless them. We give them the Messiah of Eva. What does the great Abu Draham, right? The great Spanish Rishon say, Am Baruch HaMakayim. He says, Rabbi Nishalem is Makayme Shalaylam. What does he mean to say? It's a very scary time in a lot of houses. Yeah, there's the Ben HaChacham, the child you're proud of. He went to Brisk. He's in the honors program of YU. He's tall, dark, and handsome. He's going to do a great Shidduch. He's the one you're proud of, sparkly. But then there's the Ben HaRasha. A lot of families, what do we have? We have, it could be a drug user. Child has always lost, never found himself. The dropout, who knows? He could be in prison. It could be the Tom. What does the Rambam say to Tom? The Tom is the tippish, Lash and Rambam. The underachiever. He's the terrible student, never could get into a good school, skipped from school to school, never seems to find himself. Right? These are, and the parents are standing there, and you know what? Sadly, a lot of times the parents are ashamed. One child wrote me a letter. He said, whenever guests came, they made sure I was in my room. They were so embarrassed of me. Parents are embarrassed. They're fearful. For many times, the Seder is an embarrassing time. We're talking about the Arba Banim. You know what? It's one out of four that was the hit. So what does the Torah say? My, you should always know. Baruch HaMaka in Baruch Hu Keneged Arba Banim Dibra Torah. Every child has their journey. Every child. You know, when you want to climb up a mountain, the greatest climbers in the world don't tack the north face and go straight up. They wind around the mountain. They zigzag up. They go right. They go left. The way to the top of the mountain, the journey, is often very convoluted, very unclear, opaque, and zigzaggy. What does the Torah say? What is the Baal Haggadah, the, the, the greatest, the, written with, with uh, Alpirah HaKadosh? What does the Tana tell you? Baruch HaMakayim. Every child has a Makayim in the Rabbi Nishlelem's heart. And we as parents, we as children, should never ever forget that. The way up the mountain is often zigzaggy. And we should never, Chas Shalom, be embarrassed of an underachiever, of the Ben HaRasha, the Ben HaTit, the one who doesn't meet. Every child has their journey. Every child is holy. What does the Navi say? Baruch Kvayit Hashem Im Kaimai, Yecheskel HaNavi, right? From Bavel. What does he call the Rabbani Shalem? When he's 
so far, everything seems so lost. Baruch Kivayit Hashem Mimikaymai. From the most lost places over there, we have to have, we have from our Nevi'im, from the Torah, from Aish Rabbeinu Kabbalah, the Rabbeinu Shalom has a makayim for every child, every lost person, every lonely, every embarrassed, the Rabbeinu Shalom has a makayim. And with that understanding, we could go back to the Seder and embrace our children. Baruch Shanas and Torah Liyama Yisrael goes on all of the above. Let's go to our amazing program with Rabbi Fefa. My name is Yosh Rafefer. I'm filling in this week for David. And this week we're coming into Pesach. Pesach is the time when the Jewish people were born. The Pasuk in Echezkel says, It's like our birthday. We came out of Mitzrayim as a new man, as a new people. And in fact, during Leda Seder, we celebrate our very existence. We celebrate the fact that in every generation, enemies come against us and seek to destroy us. Of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, from the moment that we came out of Mitzrayim, and to this very day, the Ashkacha, the supervision, the direction of Hakadosh Baruch Hu is what keeps us going, what keeps us alive, what helps us to survive in hours of strife, and helps us to thrive in better times as Baruch Hashem we're going through today. And it's perhaps appropriate that specifically, as we go into Pesach, we're going to be speaking this week about a basic question of what defines being Jewish. How do you define being a Jewish person? So, of course, we know how halachically we define a Jewish person, somebody who's born to a Jewish mother. But generally, we also understand that being Jewish involves a certain blood connection, a certain connection, genetic connection, if we want, between different members of the Jewish people. Of course, there are also gay people who convert into the Jewish people, and therefore not everything is a direct descent, a direct ancestry from Avais and Avisenu. But nonetheless, certainly the Jewish people is to some degree a family, to, to, to a large degree, with a close genetic connection. And the question that we'll be discussing this week is that given the incredible advances in research on genetic uh, genetic patterning, on genetic strains, um, academic and scientific research that's brought the whole field light years uh, ahead of what it was just a few decades ago, to what degree can we make use of genetic understanding in order to determine who is Jewish and who isn't Jewish? To what degree can halacha make use of, the, of this genetic research of the the, the, this whole new field of uh, genetic patterns, of DNA strains, in determining who is Jewish and who isn't. And of course, this is a very, very important issue for modern-day halacha, because there are many thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands, of Jews around the world who have a difficult time proving the fact that they're actually Jewish. This is very relevant, of course, when a person wants to get married in, in a... In a in a based-in setting with the, with the rabbi uh, This is relevant for many other halachic questions. Um, sometimes it can be relevant, of course, for kahuna and for different aspects of yichus. And often it's not easy for people coming from uh, a couple of generations of being distant from Yiddishkeit to demonstrate their Jewish credentials. Um, documentation might be very hard to reach. Adus might be difficult. People don't have direct testimony to the fact that they're Jewish, and many people have maybe a hunch or maybe an intuition or some indication of their being Jewish, but these are not always enough in a Basin setting, and often Basin will send people to do a Giyo Lechumra just to make sure, but well, this is very difficult and very sensitive and delicate, and certainly in Eretz Israel, there's also quite a lot of, of pushback, um, whether from, from, from the secular uh, groups in, in Eretz Israel and, and others, who have difficulty in, in, in the trouble that based in gives some people coming to get married um, in Eretz Israel because of lack of documentation and proof of their Jewish ancestry. And now, because of this new genetic research, which has been developed just over the last decade or two, there's a new tool available to Bate Din, both for this question and for a range of other questions, in terms of genetic mapping. We can do a, 
a fairly today, a fairly straightforward genetic test, which wasn't available at all a couple of decades ago, but today it's fairly straightforward uh, genetic testing, and, and to try to find whether the person belongs to a known genetic group that proves his Jewish pedigree. This has been, been suggested recently by one of, one of the guests we'll have later on the show, Rabbi uh, Rav Zev Litka, uh, who is a prominent figure in this developing field, together with Rabbi Israel Barenboim, uh, um, uh, Chief Rabbi of Moscow in, in Russia. Uh, and, and they've been thinking about the possibility of actually determining who in Spain and Portugal might be a descendant of the Anusim, the group of Jews in, in, in Spain that were forcibly converted, went into hiding, uh, and, and lost trace over the generations of their Jewish descent, but many thousands of them might actually be halachically Jewish. And if we could find the particular DNA strain of uh, Spanish and Portuguese Jews from the time, maybe that could be an, 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 a, a, a surprising and incredible way of demonstrating the Jewish ancestry uh, and, and the halachic Judaism of these individuals. So all of this is going to be coming up very soon. We have a range of uh, both halachically expert guests, including Harav uh, Yehuram Ullman from Australia, Rav Zev Litka uh, from Yerushalayim, Harav Sudrich, Chief Rabbi of Poland, who are all going to be joining us on this topic. We also have the academic side of things to explain the cutting-edge research in the genetic field from uh, Professor Shai Kami of of Jerusalem. Uh, but before we get to all of these interviews, let's just quickly have this week's two riddles. Two very quick, uh, not complicated riddles for this week. One of the riddles relates to the mitzvah of Abba Kaisers. We drink four cups of wine on Leila Seder, and as we know, we do not recite a bracha of Al Mitzvah Shtias Abba Kaisers, Abba Kaisers. And the question is, why not? Generally, we make a bracha over Lassiosan before we perform mitzvahs. Here we have a very concrete, a very simple mitzvah, drinking four cups of wine. Why is it that Chazal didn't enact, institute a bracha on the Arba Tachosis? That's one question. The Rukiach mentions this question. Why don't we make a bracha? Second question relates to Halel. In Halel, we say Halel el And as we know, as we know, uh, whenever we perform a mitzvah, the din of a mitzvah, generally speaking, is that it should be performed the amida, standing up. Why in the halal of Leila, Pes- of, of, of Leila Seder, of Pesach, do we say halal specifically sitting down? The chayra, the din of halal, should be standing up like other mitzvahs. Chassim Sofa asked the question. These are the two riddles that we have. Number one, why do we make a bracha on the mitzvah of Avakotis or Abanam? And why don't we stand up for the halal. And with that, we'll get straight into today's show, which is going to be speaking about the halachic perspective of genetic testing. So with us on the line, we're privileged to have Rav Mordechai Sudrich, uh, the Chief Rabbi of Poland. Rabbi Sudrich, thank you very, very much for being with us today on the show. And, um, My pleasure. I understand. Thank you very much. I understand, and, and I've been, uh, I've already been, been prepped, and uh, I saw reports in different news outlets of a, of a very special and a very emotional uh, anecdote, a story that, that you were personally involved with, which also, I think, brings to home the potential, the, 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 import, the potential importance of genetic testing and the kind of uh, significance it can have in a, in a halachic sense. Uh, would you mind sharing that, please, with, uh, with, with us and with the listeners? Well, certainly. Uh, there's a wonderful man who... Um, Jakob Wexler, who um, was born during the war outside of Vilna. Uh, but by the time he remembers as a child, he was being brought up by a, uh, a very loving Polish Catholic family because he had been given away by his Jewish biological mother as an infant in order to save him during the Shoah. Um, and the Polish family, the risk of their lives to save him, never wanted to tell him that he really wasn't theirs. And so around the age of 20, he decided that he wanted to become a priest. And um, he would even ask his parents, you know, several times, you know, I don't look like you. Are you sure they're really yours? I said, yes, yes, we love you, we love you. 
And it was only after his father died that his mother finally admitted to him that he was probably around 50 years old, um, uh, that, um, that he was a Jewish child. You know, given and the then his mother, his, mother confessed, his mother confessed to him that he was actually adopted and that really right. he's Jewish. Wow, so, okay. And, and then, uh, I guess I don't remember exactly how, he was able to track down um, his, uh, his uncle's father's brother. And it, 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 they were able to confirm the story from several different witnesses that this really is the child. Uh, and he began, so two things happened. One is he, he himself began a very long journey because he was, he was teaching, you know, Christian theology. He was a very serious thinker that wasn't, so it's a very important part of his life, in the church and Christian belief. And then he discovered he's Jewish and what he's supposed to do with it. It was a journey about 25 years, which um, came to a, a wonderful culmination uh, just uh, two months ago with uh, his, his putting on film for the first time and being called to the Torah and, Yad, and the Shul and Yad Vashem. And what was key before that, because we had all kinds of witnesses and testimonies, but there were no documents. And, uh, correctly or not, people today really want to see documents. And so and this is the, the essential part where DNA came in, that basically DNA really can't prove Jewish identity just on the basis of nothing. But what more and more uh, Rabbanim are saying is that if we have clear indications, if we're really almost certain and then everything looks like it and we have DNA proof, all of that together mm-hmm. creates um, a situation where we really could say, yes, this person is Jewish. And you think if there's already a strong red line that of ours, if there's already a strong indication, but halakhically it's not Correct. quite sufficient, then the DNA testing will, will push us over the edge. Like that, that's what certain key rabbanim are saying today, and I certainly agree mm-hmm. with them, that it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the missing piece of information that says, okay, now we accept, now we can say yes, in terms of being mm-hmm. really uh-huh. And so this individual was tested, meaning they did a DNA test on him, and he was found to be in one of the major Jewish DNA groups, Right, it came back like ninety-eight percent Ashkenazi Jewish or something like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. And that and that was sufficient for the halachic for 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 Rabbanim, for the Yonim, for whoever was was deciding his case to say, okay, this is. I mean, was this actually relevant in order to get him, for example, into into Israel to give him the right of return? This was why it was specifically relevant for him. Not, that's all, that's all a separate issue because it, you know, each story has an, its, its own individual twists and turns. He was already Israeli citizen. It was a naturalized uh-huh. Israeli citizen because he had lived in Israel for five years. Uh-huh. So this really uh-huh. was, I mean, he just wanted a statement that I am a Jew. It wasn't uh-huh. about... It was aimed to close, to close the circle. Right, it was for him to close this circle, to, to know who he is, uh, you know, finally to have the confirmation right. as it were. Right. Right. And, and so that's, what, right. that's what's so powerful, because there is no, there is no schuyot here, there is no material benefit. It really was right. just saying that he wants to be officially, you know, uh, accepted and announced as a member of Am Yisrael. Mm-hmm. Right. And from your experience, from your broader experience in in Poland and in Europe, do you see really the the potential, the 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 capacity for uh, genetic testing to really grow in in the, in the coming years? Do you see do you see this as being a major factor in in deciding halakhically the status of 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 many you know similar people, but also in other circumstances in other areas? Of, uh, of of halakhically deciding a person's status? Okay. Well, uh, first, I'm not a post-sex, I'm not a dying. But right. I, I could tell you about the needs of the community. 
what the Gadolim mm-hmm. of the post team want to decide about it, this, this we'll see with time. But the okay. need in terms of the Poland is tremendous because here you have um, thousands of people, thousands of Jews who after the war decided no longer to be Jewish, and it may have been tens of thousands, and kind of kind of like 21st, 20, 21st century on the scene, Milanos. And now the information is starting to come out, and lo and behold, um, you know, it's, sometimes people are missing documents. How are you going to prove something after 75? Now, sometimes you can find documents. Not uh-huh. always. Uh, meaning these are people who want, these are people who want to, de- to be defined as Jewish. They, they believe, or there, there are indications that they're Jewish, but they just can't prove it. They don't have enough documentation. They don't have a ksuba. They don't have uh, a matseva. They don't have the, the traditional means of proving that they're actually Jewish. Correct. And so therefore, uh-huh. this idea of accepting DNA is tremendously helpful. And again, uh, uh-huh. I, as I said before, I'm not a post I'm not a dion, so I'm not going to say on what basis this is acceptable or not, but I've seen Dayan and, and Poitzkin writing today that this can be a, a um, that kind of the fine point. It's, you already have a basis. This could say, okay, yes, we accept it. Mm-hmm. And and the Makabah Patish, the Makabah Patish in the case. Right. right. Uh, Makabah is very good. Makabah is exactly right. Very well put. And and now in the, in the last year or so, when we really see that the, that because the, the, the database is growing, and therefore there's a greater um, verifiability, that I see this is something that's going to be very important here. It will be important right. all over the world, and especially here, here in East Central Europe, where people gave up their identity after the war, and then some right. come back, some don't come back. We have situations where yeah. two siblings who are now in their 70s, one says, yes, we're really Jewish, and one says, absolutely not. Right. And Do you have any push? Is there any push? Sorry, go ahead. I, I, no, I'm sorry, yes. I just wanted to ask, I'm out of interest, is there any pushback from people that when you mention the possibility of doing DNA testing. Do people feel maybe uneasy about it? It sounds a bit racial. Maybe it's not so, you know, in, in, in the modern age, perhaps, there are some overtones of, you know, racial kind of profiling that people might feel uneasy with. Do, do, do you get any sense of that, or people are generally um, satisfied to undergo it and, and people accept it willingly? Generally. Um, in my experience, is that the people say, listen, if this is going to help prove that I'm Jewish, let's go for it. Mm-hmm. I, I have had one case where the person said, no, I'm not doing it. No, if, you know, I know I'm Jewish. I'm not, I don't have to prove anything. Mm. All right. But it's also all right. normal with the human experience that you'll get all kinds of different responses. Mm-hmm. But overall... People are happy to do it because, it, it, you know, if it can provide a positive result, right. so, so, so that's a main thing. That's People are I'm happy to do it because they're anxious to be accepted as Jewish. Um, and I'm anxious to accept them as long as I have a basis to do so. Right. Right, of course. Uh, Rabbi Shudrich, you should be very to have um, many more such uh, inspiring stories, and I'm sure you will, Amit Hashem. And thank you very much for sharing the experience with us. Uh, important My for us to, to be aware of the kind of thing and it is a massive luck for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you and call us. So today alongside our halakhic expert we also have a scientific expert, meaning a research expert who is really involved in the cutting edge field of genetic research and this is Dr. Shai Karmi. Uh, Dr. Karmi is currently an assistant professor at the School of Public Health at the Hebrew University. His PhD was from Barilan. He did a postdoc at Columbia. And he's been really involved in the kind of latest developing research on developing on uh, Jewish ancestry based on genetical research. Dr. Kami, thank you very much for being with us today. You're welcome. And um, if I can ask you perhaps just to start off with a, a general introduction. Many of our listeners 
they know what DNA is, they've heard of genetic research, um, but the connection and, and the method, the methodology by which we develop research on ancestry based on DNA samples, based on genetic uh, sampling, uh, is something that you know m many of us have never experienced and um, certainly haven't learned in depth. So maybe give us like a basic overview. How did this work? Um, how, what, what's, the, what's the kind of 101, genetics 101, to understand how do we determine um, Jewish ancestry, uh, which obviously is, is based on, on mothers more than fathers, uh, based on, on genetic researching? Okay, so um, before we uh, focus on, on mothers, uh, let's talk about the genome or the DNA in, in general. So the DNA is okay. uh, transmitted between parents and children. Um, so you know it goes, it remains in the family, and um, and, and also um, if uh, people marry within a community, marry within you know um, one group within a population, then the genomes or the DNA sequence of uh, individuals within a population tend to be pretty similar to one another. People have the same mutations or, uh, or they have uh, same similar frequencies uh, of uh, mutations. And, um, uh, and if, we, if we compare one person to another, then we can see that people from the same population, they tend to, have, uh, they tend to be more similar to one another, like they're gen genetically similar, meaning their, their DNA sequence um, uh, tends to be similar compared to people from a uh, distinct population. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if I look at the DNA of a pair of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, um, they will be very similar to one another uh, genetically, whereas if I look at an Ashkenazi Jew and uh, maybe a person from Africa or from, from Asia, they will be genetically uh, distinct. And, uh, and, and this is the basis for uh, using DNA sequencing uh, to learn about to learn about ancestry. Uh, and this right. is, uh, meaning, meaning yeah. let, let me just let me just interject, Dr. Kami. Even if we assume that everyone came, or let's say uh, uh, let, let's assume that everyone came from a single parent, but over a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, we're going to assume that this is going to branch out into many different mutations, many different groups, or will we, be able to, will, will we be able to trace everything back to that same ancestor thousands of years ago? So, so it's never one ancestor. It's always um, a group of ancestors or a population that's evolving through time. So uh, each generation, people have, uh, like, let's say the population has 1,000 people. Uh, they have uh, children uh, forming the next generation, and, and they form the next generation, and, and so on. But as long as the population remains remains uh, relatively close, meaning there is no or there is very little um, conversion in and out, like uh, in mm -hmm. the case of uh, Jewish populations, most of the time, uh, most of recent times at least, then um, th then the, there's also no. Um, no introduction of new uh, DNA sequences, and th therefore uh, mm -hmm. DNA re remains relatively similar between individuals in the in the population. So it's not exactly that you are tracing the ancestry of all Jews, for example, to one ancestor. It's just that they uh, they come from the same population. Is that okay? Um, okay. Um, so what what I would like to explain next is that um, so the genome has uh, uh, several components. Um, the the first component is the uh, it's called the autosome or autosomal genome. These are chromosomes one to twenty two. So we have uh, each one of us has uh, two pairs. Uh, sorry, has a pair of each of these chromosomes. So I have my um, um, one copy of uh, chromosome one that I received from my father and one copy that I received from my mother. And same for chromosome two, chromosome three, and so on until chromosome twenty two. Um, and then we have the sex chromosomes, which are chromosome X and chromosome uh, Y. So um, males have one X and one Y, and females have two copies of X. Um, and uh, overall, uh, all of these chromosomes, these 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, they, uh, they, they are combined, they are called the nuclear genome, 
and, and that's a pretty long sequence. So the size is 3 billion, 3 billion letters, letters of uh, DNA. The letters can be A, C, G, or T. Um, so that's a you know a long sequence of letters that uh, has, of course, a, a biological importance. These are the instructions. This is the code that uh, tells the, the cells in our body uh, how to function. Um, so obviously it's important in medicine and, and so on, uh, but this is also where mutations okay. uh, are encoded that can distingu and distinguish between different, just one second, that can distinguish between right. different uh, individuals. The other component, um, which, um, which is called the mitochondrial DNA, uh, so this, is, this part of the genome is very short, it's only around 17, 17,000 uh, letters, so it's uh, orders of magnitude smaller than the uh, nuclear genome, and um, uh, and it's uh, it's it's very special because it originally like uh, like uh, millions of years ago it comes from from bacteria that merged with uh, human uh, cells. Uh, I mean they were not human that merged with uh, eukaryotic cells to be more precise doesn't matter, but. Um, the the point is about this mitochondrial DNA is that not but not only it's it's um, biologically different from the rest of the DNA but it's also only uh, transmitted from mother to child. So my mitochondrial DNA mm -hmm. is uh, coming only from uh, my mother. Uh, recently, some people, uh, very recently, people noticed uh, one exception, like one case where uh, they also noted. Uh, transmission from the father, but this is extremely rare up to now, you know, like decades of research, um, only only one relatively solid case where it was seen to be transmitted from the father. So, so we can say this this goes mm -hmm. from mother to to, daughter, to daughter. Um, and now From mother to daughter about, or from ma you also from mother to son? Well, also I don't mother understand. to son, but the son, but the son does not transmit it. Uh, the son will not transmit it, to, meaning we all have... Yeah. Well, whether we're male or female, we have mitochondrial DNA, which is part of our DNA se sequence, but we get it only from our mothers. This exactly. is something which we receive from mothers alone. So this is going to be very helpful when we're going to speak about halachically determining uh, whether you're Jewish or not, because this comes specifically mother to child, mm -hmm. meaning it's, it's, a, it's a mother transmission. Okay, got it. Right. But, but before, we get, before we get there... Uh, let me talk about the technologies. So, uh, um, so as I as I said, the DNA is very long. It, it consists of three billion letters, and it costs a lot of money to sequence all the letter, all all those letters, meaning to 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 read the the entire sequence of the DNA that an individual has. So, uh, to sequence the first genome, it cost uh, at the time, like uh, nearly 20 years ago, it cost. Um, billions of dollars. Nowadays, it's only around $1,000, uh, which is a huge mm -hmm. uh, reduction in, in the price. But even better, we have a, another technology that called microarray or chip a, or DNA chip that allows us we, 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 um, to, to read the genome even for a much lower price, around $50. And the key point is that we're not looking at the entire sequence. We are only looking at uh, selected mutations, selected points selected letters in the genome, around a million of them. Okay, so the older technologies mm -hmm. looked at much, much smaller numbers, but these technologies are outdated by now. Um, it will be a waste of time to look back into the data that was generated this way. The relatively modern chips from the past uh, 10 years or, or a bit more, um, they, are, uh, they look at between a uh, few hundreds of thousands of uh, mutations to about a million mutations. And what's important about it is that we don't need the entire sequence because most of the sequence is, is very similar between two individuals. Like if I compare my genome to yours, for example, then we're going to be around 99.9% uh, the same, identical. Uh, right. So we really now, care about There are certain points where we find the mutations. The mutations are only in certain points. Exactly. So, uh, in particular, like the frequent mutations, the common mutations are only in a certain position, about a few millions of positions of, of uh, locations in the genome-specific letters where we uh, that we know that that uh, that have these mutations. And if you look just at them, we don't even need to look at all of them. We just we can look at just a subset of them. Uh, we can get very okay. good uh, inf um, coverage of like the 
uh, or we, more precisely, we can capture most of the information about ancestry that our genomes have uh, using just those million uh, mutations. And this is very cheap. Okay. It only costs uh, around $50. And then um, and the number of people who uh, did this uh, kind of sequencing, more precisely it's called genotyping, uh, is now in the tens of millions, mostly uh, due to companies like uh, Ancestry or 23andMe or MyHeritage and so on. And right, many people who are interested yeah. in discovering their heritage, then they enter into this database. And, and now yeah. we've got a big database. So, so you know what? T tell me how, uh, now, why is this now, now interest? Yeah. yeah. Right. So let's connect it to... Now, I'd, I'd like to, to know two things. Uh, First of all, why is this interesting? Yeah. And Jewish ancestry, exactly. Pr plug yeah. me into Jewish ancestry. Why is this interesting, number one, generally for Jewish ancestry, for, you know, understanding maybe... Um, uh, where, where the Jews came from, Ashkenazi Jews, Sadi Jews, and so on. Uh, and more specifically, in, in a halachic sense, uh, how does this work in terms of, of, of actually identifying uh, a person's Jewish ancestry? Okay, so um, um, so when, when this technology came out, again around uh, 10 years ago, then there were uh, academic studies um, that uh, simply they sampled... Um, let's say a few dozens of uh, Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardi Jews and, and uh, Jews from other uh, communities, and they wanted to know what their genomes uh, look like. And, and then it was, um, a, they found that um, indeed there is similarity between Ashkenazi Jews and also a very strong similarity and then weaker similarity between uh, Jews from other groups uh, and so on. But the, the, the implication is that, uh, let's say that I am a, I am an Ashkenazi Jew, then when I get my genome sequenced, um, then um, I can compare my genome to the genomes of, let's say, 100 people, 100 other people who were previously sequenced, and I know about them that they are Ashkenazi Jews, usually by report, by self-report. These people are declared that they are Ashkenazi Jews by, let's say, all four mm -hmm. uh, grandparents. Uh, if I see... Uh, and then if I if I see that my genome is similar to their genomes, then I can infer, I can learn that I am uh, that I I have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So this way we can tell for each uh, person that takes this uh, test, the microarray test, uh, we can tell that person like what is the percentage of your genome coming from uh, that has let's say Ashkenazi ancestry or Sephardi ancestry. Uh, so for example, uh, for most Ashkenazi people with four uh, Ashkenazi grandparents. They will have. They will come up as having 100% or nearly 100% Ashkenazi ancestry in those uh, tests. Those tests, if you know, if you take them with one of the companies. Um, and uh, but for example, if if a person has uh, one uh, Ashkenazi parent and one uh, non-Jewish parent, then these uh, tests will show uh, around 50% Ashkenazi ancestry. So these tests are pretty accurate to distinguish between people who are Ashkenazi or non-Ashkenazi, uh, also for some uh, other Jewish groups. And, uh, and they can also tell, give us fractional estimates. Uh, they can also identify people with only one gra uh, grandparent or sometimes even only one great-grandparent, even though this is, bec this mm. is becoming more, uh, more noisy. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. more, uh, that's more, more difficult to say. Let, let me just but, ask you this, uh, by yeah, the way, okay. let me ask you this, by the way, so, sorry to interrupt, but just uh, an okay. aside question. Is there a, a, a clear similarity also in the DNA sequence between Jews in general, meaning Ashkenazi Jews, and Sephardi Jews, and non-Ashkenazi Jews, or is that, does that come up as being completely different? So, so, there are, so these groups are more similar to one another than compared to, uh, let's say, Europeans or uh, Asians or Africans. Uh, Africa, so there, right. is, there is similarity, although it's uh, it's relatively weak. It's not as strong as seen when you compare people who are like within their communities. When you compare Ashkenazi to Ashkenazi, or Sephardi, like let's say North African Jews to North African Jews, or Iraqi Jews to Iraqi Jews, and mm -hmm. so on. So these com each of these communities, okay. they, they have uh, they are very uh, individuals are very similar genetically to one another. And I also need to mention okay. is that uh, what. Um, you know these these reports obviously they don't give us uh, a, anything about uh, faith or identity. They just give us a, what we call genetic ancestry. They they can tell individual okay you are Ashkenazi right. by genetic ancestry, but but obviously they right. are meaningless about anything that um, you know cultural or 
you know. Cultural or yeah, religion, so religion oriented. But right, yeah. and, and also what you told me so far also doesn't help to tell you whether the person is actually Jewish or not, because a grandparent or a great grandparent could be a man, could be um, a, a woman, but her daughter, uh, uh, but, but, but it's coming from her son and not from her daughter. So we still don't know if the person is halakhically Jewish or not. We just know that he has some Jewish uh, genetic sequencing or Jewish DNA, if you want. Correct. And um, uh, so, um, so yes, this is the key point: is that uh, these uh, these tests for the for the autosomal DNA. When we look at the autosomal, like meaning that the part that we get from both parents, they tell us something about the ancestry coming from both of our parents. So they cannot distinguish between, or I mean, at least not easily, they cannot distinguish between uh, uh, between the part of the. A genome coming from from each parent, and and even if I if I take the test for uh, Ashkenazi ancestry and then I get uh, something like 99% Ashkenazi ancestry, uh, it cannot ex- exclude the possibility that let's say my you know all of let's say I look back uh, 10 generations ago and all of my ancestors back then were uh, Ashkenazi Jewish except for my mother's mother's mother and mother. So just my maternal yeah. just the maternal line. So. So you know the, it will be correct. Like the the estimate will be correct. I will have 99% Ashkenazi ancestry, but it, it doesn't tell me that if I only care about this, like the maternal line, my mother's, you know, the mother of my mother of my mother, and so on. Then um, this, let's say, and this one percent is uh, is non-Jewish. Then it, it cannot. I cannot tell that it was her specifically. So uh, um, so this make the uh, so this uh, limitation makes these uh, tests. Um, not as useful for uh, for this halachically halachic purpose, purpose. Right. yes. Um, right. And uh, but on the other end, what uh, what we have is this additional component of the genome, which is called the mitochondrial DNA. That I remind you. Right. How uh, long ago? For how many years have we been? For how many years have we been using the the mitochondrial DNA? That's relative. That's newer, meaning that's a, a more recent uh, development uh, in in uh, so, genetic so, research. No, so so it was uh, it was studied that uh, it was studied actually even even before the autosomal genome was was studied uh, because it's easier to study for uh, some technical reasons. Uh, so actually, data on mitochondrial DNA became available already on Ashkenazi Jews uh, already long ago, uh, possibly decades ago. And, um, uh, and the, but the key paper was uh, came out in uh, 2006. Uh, by Doron Behar and uh, Karl Skoretsky and uh, colleagues, and uh, uh, and this is really the the important paper for for our purposes here. And what they found is that uh, in the Ashkenazi population, uh, about 40% of the uh, of Ashkenazi Jews they uh, they carry mitochondrial DNA. They carry a very specific, or more precisely, one of four very specific mitochondrial sequences. So. Um, so let's uh, rephrase it. Meaning, so, let, so let's, let's say, translate yeah. that into into English. So, we, so right. m- most Ashkenazi Jews come from four mothers. That's what you're <laughs> yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't particularly like four. the term four mothers, but but um, uh, but you know, um, let's say in in, in layman language, that, that's correct. Uh, but it's not it's not the majority. It's forty percent. It's n- nearly half of Ashkenazi Jews. So forty percent. Um, okay. Yeah. So for example. Um, uh, so let's say I take a random Ashkenazi Jew uh, from the street, then uh, and I and I look at the DNA sequence. So um, there is a let's say probability around a half that this person has um, one of these four special mitochondrial DNA sequences. And what's so special about them? That only Ashkenazi Jews have them in considerable frequency. So so these ah. these uh, these sequences. So for example, one of them it's called uh, K1A1B1A. That's this, you know, complicated name, which d- doesn't matter. But right. uh, this is a short name for a for a sequence, a sp- very specific sequence mm-hmm. of the of the 17,000 uh, uh, letters of the mitochondrial DNA. Um, nice. So this specific sequence, it uh, it appears in 20% of uh, Ashkenazi Jews. So really, one in five Ashkenazi, Jew. Ashkenazi Jews have this. Uh, have this uh, particular uh, mitochondrial DNA sequence, but this sequence is extremely right. rare outside Ashkenazi Jews. So, uh, like meaning that if we test somebody really know, on the but, street, yeah, and we find that he has this DNA sequence, let's call it uh, Sarah or Rivka or 
whoever it is, it's some ancestor. By the way, do you know how long ago, how many generations ago these sequences uh, uh, reflect? Like, how, how far back do these go? Do we know? Uh, so there are some estimates. I think it was around uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 years. Can't you remember the precise estimates? Uh -huh. um, That's a long but, time but ago. But it was so long it, ago. It's been around yeah. for a long time. Yes. And, and probably if even before, street, probably even before the formation of of Ashkenazi Jews. I mean, have in mind that uh, Ashkenazi okay. Jews were, were formed as a as a community, as a, as a group, only around 1,000 years ago. Uh, so it's right. probably even uh, earlier than that. And also uh, we need to have in mind... This is from the Levant, from, from somewhere, right. Okay. That, 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 oh, that's ahead. a different uh, question. That's a, you know, that's a different uh, <laughs> research that uh, we can talk about uh, later. But, but uh, we also need to have in mind that we don't necessarily know what was the ancestry of that, of that, uh, of that mother. So that mother who lived, let's say, 1,500 years ago, um, I mean, the studies, the the current studies are uh, a, do not agree about like where that mother came from, whether she came from the Middle East or from or from or from Europe, and definitely we don't know if she if that mother has considered herself uh, Jewish. So maybe that's a person who converted. You mean, you, well, you mean maybe uh, she converted, or maybe somebody right? I, I understand. maybe only some of but her daughters converted. So we we don't even right. you know oh, oh, we can't even tell. But whoever converted, whoever it is. That became a dominant. Yeah, but they they had they had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of mazel or a lot of siyata deshnaya in having a, a very successful uh, Jewish progeny. They had a lot of descendants. And if we find somebody from the street, we test his DNA. Uh, he goes through this genetic screening, and we find the sequence. Then we could say like a 99.9 percent .9 probability that this person is halachically Jewish. That, that's what you're telling me. Uh, is that correct? That would be correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I would leave to you the the halachic interpretations, but but uh, what we can. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I'm saying statistically. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so 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 we can give more precise numbers. It, it doesn't matter, but but we can say that with very high probability, this person has uh, Ashkenazi Jewish genetic ancestry. That, that's the way you know. That's a scientific mm -hmm. way that I would uh, uh, I would phrase it. Okay. Uh, and this is but again because. Because you know, one okay. in five people, uh, one in five Ashkenazi Jewish people carry this sequence, but almost it's almost absent uh, in other peoples. So, like, if okay. you are not Ashkenazi Jews, you are probably not going to have it. So, so if you find, if we have a pe person from the street, this person has this sequence, very likely this person has Ashkenazi genetic ancestry. And then there's the, a the similar okay. situation with three other sequences. So the three other mothers so to say, um, mm -hmm. and altogether they form around 40%. So that was the 2006 okay. paper. And, and if we, uh, if we you know, uh, work harder and we look at uh, even more data, probably we can uh, extend it. Uh, we can find more mothers, but the, the, the frequencies will be uh, uh, lower. So, for example, the, the, the sequence I mentioned earlier, uh, it's, by the way, it's also called haplogroup um, mm -hmm. or haplotype. Uh, so that sequence, the K1A1, B1A, it's 20% of Ashkenazi Jews, but this is really exceptional. This is very high frequency. But maybe we also have uh, we also have other other sequences that can be, let's say, 5% or 3% in Ashkenazi Jews and also absent uh, outside Ashkenazi Jews. So these are also useful. These sequences are also could be, in a sense, diagnostic about uh, Ashkenazi genetic ancestry, uh, but they are not as frequent. So they are, you know, in a sense, also less important. Um, Right. So, so overall, it's so, about f half of Ashkenazi Jews that have this kind of diagnostic mitochondrial DNA. So that's about half, and uh, and the other half they have uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences or again haplotypes that are uh, that also appear in other populations. So they're going to be also common mm -hmm. in uh, in Europe or in the Middle East. And and these uh, these sequences are simply not uh, they're not diagnostic. They they are not telling us anything about uh, whether this individual is Ashkenazi or not. If uh, if we see them, so a person carrying this uh, sequence, uh, you know, he, he could he or she could be uh, he could have Ashkenazi ancestry, but could also have uh, other ancestries. Right. So, tell me, t take me, take me just for a minute to uh, to the study world. Do we have any significant mothers or significant DNA sequences 
for Saudi for the Saudi Jewish population, or, or over there it's more more complicated, more difficult. Um, so for uh, Saudi Jews or, or for non Ashkenazi Jews in general, it's uh, it's more complicated. Um, they don't have um, anything uh, as uh, at least uh, let's say striking as in Ashkenazi Jews sequence of 20% frequency uh, that's not found elsewhere. Um, so mm-hmm. most of the non Ashkenazi Jews they they don't have it. Um, so this uh, technology cannot be used. It cannot be used in this uh, in the halachic context. Meaning they don't have um, these, these kind of exclusive. They don't have these exclusive groups that right. we can say right. this so, is. Okay. So, or I mean, and to be more precise, because because we you know, uh, um, it's not that they were. It's not that they. I mean, the studies can go deeper into. I mean, some, it was simply not. Also, it was not studied deeply enough. Maybe there are some. Uh, sequences that are exclusive, but at least there's nothing like uh, as dramatic as we see in, in Ashkenazi Jews mm-hmm. that, uh, that's mm-hmm. so frequent. Uh, exceptions mm-hmm. are, uh, th- there are some exceptions, for example, uh, in the smaller communities. Uh, for example, there are uh, uh, Jewish communities from the Caucasus. Mm-hmm. There are two groups there that are, um, that have, uh, there it's even more striking compared to Ashkenazi Jews. They have spe- exclusive mitochondria DNA sequence. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if it's exclusive, but but the frequency is is nearly 50%. So, so almost 50% of those uh, of this community, people in this community, they have this. Uh, uh, they, they have, have the this, same, uh, the same mitochondrial the same DNA sequence. Okay. Exactly. I don't remember if it's exclusive or not. Uh, sorry about that. Right. Okay. Um, so, so Dr. Kami, take me take me now a little bit to the future. How can we still improve? Um, is the database today as complete as we need it to be. Are we doing the analysis of the sequence? Um, are we doing the entire sequence or are we only doing a small part of it? Meaning, in which way would we would be able to actually make this research even more useful, even more, uh, uh, e- even more you know, ha- helpful in being able to determine uh, Jewish ancestry, which is, you know, we could think about doing so, so many, you know, fascinating things, going back to the Jews of Spain and Portugal, for example, and you know, figuring out who among this huge non-Jewish population uh, actually comes from from Jewish origins and, and is even Jewish based on the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, you know, to take us ahead a bit, how can this technology be still uh, improved or the research be, be, you know, taken a step further in order to uh, to develop this even more? Okay, so, um, uh, so most of what people do in the academia, at least, is, uh, is studies of the... It's called the demographic history of the of the population, Jewish or other population. So we um, so we look at uh, so, so we try to learn about uh, how the population size uh, changed in the past. For example, so for example, in Ashkenazi Jews, we um, I mean studies from from my lab and, and other labs uh, showed that uh, uh, the Ashkenazi population size was very small, actually about uh, less than thousand years ago. Um, only thousands of people, or, or even or even less, uh, and and this is reflected in the number of uh, disease mutations that Ashkenazi Jews have. So, so probably everyone knows about uh, the importance of uh, doing genetic testing before uh, having children. If if both um, a husband and wife are Ashkenazi Jews because of all the genetic diseases in the population. So this is all a, a result of a, of the Ashkenazi population being very small. Uh, not so long ago, and then expanding very, very fast. Um, so we are studying questions like uh, such as this. We are also studying questions uh, like uh, trying to learn more about the, the origin of Ashkenazi Jews, like which populations in Europe uh, contributed to Ashkenazi ancestry, which populations in the Middle East, uh, and what is the relationship between those uh, populations. So these are kind of the research questions that we try to uh, try to look at, and. Um, I, I would say in the academia we try to stay away from questions of um, uh, what does it imply ancestry. about Jewishness. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean we so we look at ancestry generally, but we try not to. Uh, we leave it for others to, you know, to w- to decide whether they want to use the results for. Uh, a, right to make the implications, you know, the halachic implications. That's exactly, not what you do in exactly. academia, but. Exactly. But, but, but as if, the database grows, yeah. will we be yeah, able but, to identify, you know, new groups? We'll we'll be able to get it get into that other fifty percent, let's say, that's currently 
more in the dark. Well, you know, is there right. is there so, room for improving? Is there room mm-hmm. for developing this further? Yes, yeah. So, so that's a that's a good question, and. Um, so it's uh, it's unknown exactly how much we can improve. So surely we can get to 100 percent. I mean, for sure there is a large uh, proportion of the of Ashkenazi Jews they have a mitochondrial DNA that's not exclusive, that's found in other populations, and it's not useful uh, for halachic purposes. Um, but we can if we if we sample more individuals and. Also, if we if we sequence the entire uh, mitochondrial DNA, like the entire uh, 17,000 uh, uh, letters, letters uh, right. which is something that we don't always do right now. Sometimes we just look at the at the most important uh, 600 letters uh, because these are the mm-hmm. most informative, the most informative. But but actually, if we if we look at the entire sequence, which is is not very expensive right now. I mean, it used to be more expensive, and now it's it's doable. Um, then. Um, uh, then we can get higher resolution, and then we can maybe we can find more. Uh, we can explain a larger proportion go beyond the 40 percent. I don't know where it will, mm-hmm. you know, reach. Maybe 50 percent, maybe 60 percent. It's very hard to uh, to predict. Uh, but find it, you know, find find a very specific high resolution uh, mitochondrial sequences that these individuals are carrying that are exclusive to to Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so, uh, so I think this is where it can, uh, um, you know, improve in the in the future. Um, again, I need to point out that this is not; uh, these are not kind of studies that people do in the, you know, for research in the right. academia. Um, right. I mean, let let me just let me it. ask you one one. Let me ask you just a, a, a final question. This is really just out of curiosity, um, but you know, as 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 I'm sure you, you're well aware, within the Jewish population. We also have different uh, shvatim, different tribes. Um, do we find, let's say, you know, and, and people have a very strong heritage if they're Kohanim, if they're Levian, uh, do we find that all the Kohanim that are tested have their own specific sequence of DNA? Obviously, this is paternal, not maternal, but it should show up in some way. Or all the Levian have a, a specific uh, sequence. How, how does that, uh, has that been researched? Right, so so these were even like the even earlier studies from uh, started around uh, 20 years ago, pioneering studies of uh, uh, Karl Skoretsky. Um, and the Y chromosome, which I mentioned uh, in the beginning, is uh, transmitted from father to son. So it's uh, really like the opposite okay. of mitochondrial DNA, and then it should be right. informative about uh, about uh, paternal... Parental uh, ancestry, right. Paternal, yeah, paternal ancestry. Um uh, like uh, being uh, like belonging to Kohanim or Olivim, and uh, what okay. they found, without getting into you know uh, technical details, is that um, indeed there are Y chromosome sequences or Y chromosome haplotypes that are characteristics of uh, Kohanim and a uh, different uh, type that that's uh, more common in in Levim, uh, hmm. but it definitely doesn't explain uh, everything. So so for example. Hmm. Uh, this sequence, this particular sequence, let's say, uh, I don't remember the precise percentage. Maybe, I think around 30% of Kohanim they they carry this uh, this sequence, and um, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it, it means two things. It means that 70% of them don't. So they they necessarily came from a different uh, uh, from you know, different um, original right from different original yeah. fathers. But and, a and also there are some people who are who are not Kohanim okay. or uh, Israeli Israel and and they. Uh, they also carry this sequence, so uh, mm. so lower frequency compared to Kohanim, but but it it also means that um, so so it's not it's not unique to to Kohanim, uh, and same for 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 Levine. Mm-hmm. So uh, so we need to have these limitations in mind. That said, it's still quite fascinating because the uh, the signation of someone as Kohen or Levine right. it's uh, transmitted culturally, and but it also has right. some biological uh, support. Yeah, I do need to point out that you know not everyone is happy about about this. <laughs> so uh, and this is as you in, know, in as which sense? We mean some people some people yeah. are upset by the research being used in this kind of religious way. This is something that some academics are unhappy about. Uh, yes, some academics are unhappy about, and some people. I mean, the you know uh, the the pu- parts of the public are also unhappy about. I mean, they didn't do a survey or anything, but but. Uh, Obviously, we we have to have in mind that uh, while some people, you know, are happy to use these results for uh, for 
uh, you know, for you, like, do you use these results in, in uh, Batadine and so on? Uh, well, again, we're, we're only using happy. them to help. Yeah. Generally, yeah, so, they've been used to help yeah. people. We, we, you you, you right. can't tell anyone that he's not Jewish based on these results because we don't know. If somebody converted, you never know, but you can help a person to know that he is Jewish. I mean, that, that, That's right. I mean, that, this is all correct, but in particular in Israel because uh, the Batadine are, are uh, they, you know, they carry importance for uh, civil life or becoming a citizen or right. uh, getting married and all that. So uh, some people, both in academia and in the public, feel uncomfortable about this. Uh, my, uh -huh. you know, per personally, uh, I think that first it's important to get the science right and uh, make sure everyone understands the science. And uh, right. whether it should be used or, or not, that's, uh, you know, up to everyone to, uh, to, to, you know, consider and decide. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you again for being with us. Really uh, uh, interesting and illuminating. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All the best. Bye -bye. So we're privileged to have with us on the show Rabbi Zev Litka. Rabbi Litka is probably the foremost, at least one of the foremost experts in the world on the issue of generally uh, the issue of Jewish ancestry, of clarifying, verifying uh, a person's Jewish identity, and certainly in the field of genetic testing in this framework. Uh, Rabbi Litka is the head of an institute which is called Simanim. It's an institute that deals exclusively with this issue of genetic testing and verifying a person's Jewish status, a person's Jewish uh, credential. Um, and uh, together with Rabbi Dernbaum of, uh, of, uh, of Moscow, of Russia, um, really, you know, we're, we're among the founders uh, of, the, of the field. Rabbi Litka is a Dayan uh, under a bunch of vices uh, based in, in Yerushalayim and also a close friend. So Rabbi Litka, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's very important for us to hear you, so thank you for being with us. Yes, it's my pleasure. We heard before from Dr. Kami from Hebrew University. He's a, a leading researcher. You're very well acquainted with him. About the technical aspects, the way that this research works, and he explained that he can reach a high level of statistical probability that a person who's undergone genetic testing and is found to be in one of these groups, which is considered um, a fairly exclusive group um, of a genetic strand or, or, or genetic, uh, a genetic um, fingerprint that indicates that he belongs to a maternal group which is predominantly Jewish. Now, can you please explain to us, how does this translate into halacha? Is this considered a certain proof? Is this 100%? How does halacha recognize this? Mm -hmm. You know, halacha yes. deals with roi, it deals with chazaka. How, how does this translate into halacha? Yes. This evidence that, you know, that uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, nearly 100% and sometimes less um, depends on the results. It depends on the case. We have to look at all the the, the picture to, to understand exactly. Um, in the in the big groups in the the Jewish national population, um, I think it's a uh, hundred percent that uh, they are Jewish. Um, it, this it is the twenty percent group. The group that this is the the, the largest group that we found. Uh, you know, yes, the, the largest these, these group. Four, Yes, these four or five, or maybe uh, maybe six, four or five is yes, or, or, uh, uh, quite a, a big groups, Jewish groups, and, and in these groups, uh, these uh, these uh, uh, at all um, non-Jewish. Maybe there is uh, one, two, but not not, not not much. So this is a, mm. a, a good a good group. Uh, good proof uh, that uh, they, are, they are Jewish, and it goes um, uh, through the, the sugya of Rov. Um, Rov, Rov the, the genetic family is Jewish, so Rov, uh, you can uh, you can you can uh, pass him that uh, they are Jewish. Right, and it, this would be a Roy, this would be like a Roy of Mufhat, you would say. This would be, you know, an absolute Rov. It would also be, I mean, your, your institute is called Simonim, so this would be Simonim, the most Mufhak, the most Simonim Mufhakim, the, the best Simonim you could ever have. 
Yes, but yes, but but this is just the the, the big groups. These these other results that you also can use it with other uh, documents, with other uh, um, uh, evidence, and to look on all the the, the picture. I will tell you. I will tell you. I will, I will, uh, so let, let me just answer that. before 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 you jump to the to an anecdote. Let me just get this clear. If somebody comes from from Poland, he is from a non-Jewish family. We don't know anything about him. He comes out of, out of nowhere, and he says, "You know what? Um, I want to test myself because of some reason. Because he wants to get married to somebody Jewish, or because he is married, or just because he wants to do a test for no reason." And you test him, and he comes out in one of these, let's call them the big four. He's he's one of the he's in one of these big four groups. Then he'll say, listen, halachically, you're a Jewish person. You don't need to do anything. He doesn't need gayness. He doesn't need the conversion. Yes, I understand. He doesn't need yes, to do I... anything. He is. Mm-hmm. I understand. If you ask me, I believe it's, it's Jewish, and I believe it's it's enough. Uh, so we mm-hmm. wrote uh, uh, on, on, on the books that we published a book with uh, Robert Birnbaum, so I wrote it over there. But uh, this is, uh, I think, like this. Uh, I think, uh, uh, but uh, uh, um, some Rabbonim uh, doesn't want to accept it alone. Mm-hmm. Meaning they would say, let's 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 bring him through a a, a gayer lechumra. Anyway, which which makes life more complicated. I don't know. I don't know. If you are, again, if you ask me, I think it doesn't it doesn't need a girls at all. Uh-huh. If, okay. if, if, and then you were saying, it, but you okay. If you from this, but, but you would right, 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 right. As I told you, this is just the the, the big clear groups. That 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 right. uh, it's very uh, improved that they are Jewish. But there's, there's a, a, a lot of uh, Jewish people that they are known from uh, uh, those groups. Uh, for example, I will tell you a story that a, a case that I had a few months ago. Um, was a woman from Ukraine. Um, her grand, grandmother was 100% Jewish from Ukraine, and in the war she, she ran away to Azerbaijan. She lived over there. This is in, in, the, in the war, in, in the First World War, in the, in the Second World War. In the Second, second World War, yeah. Second World uh, War, she ran away from the Ukraine to Azerbaijan, okay. Yes, and uh, over there, she, she lived over there in a small village uh, um, around of Baku. She married a, a non-Jewish uh, man from over there, and she had a daughter. And, and her daughter, daughter um, we don't know if uh, she's the original daughter or maybe she's adopted. Uh, the rabbinical mm-hmm. uh, in uh, Beidin in Tel Aviv saw that she's adopted. They had the reason why, why they think uh, that she's adopted. Uh, she didn't know. That, she didn't know that she was adopted. She didn't know anything. I, I don't know if she didn't know. She said she's not. Okay. I tested the, I tested the, the, the granddaughter. She was in, in the basin in Tel Aviv, and uh, okay. the result the result was um, that there is uh, she is from from a, from a group uh, that there is in uh, Ashkenazim, a uh, one point five percent. She's in a, a, a small. So this is like a small group. This is not one of the big uh, groups, but it's still pretty big. Yeah, it's quite big, but. But in this group, there is also non-Jewish around on the Ukraine. So you can't tell... Okay, so it's not an exclusive percent. group. This is not an exclusive group, so it's not a proof that she's Jewish. Yes. But then I told them that uh, I looked uh, on the story, and I told them that is because if she's adopted, she was born in, in uh, Azerbaijan. So it makes sense that she has, she has, she has to be uh, aged, and she's not. So I told them that the, hmm. the results here is very clear. She is not aged. Meaning she right. Meaning that the you're not just testing what she is. You're also checking no, what no, she is. No, no, we can see. No, we, we can we can see that these uh, in, in the Ashkenazi population these these uh, quite a lot like like her, but these are non Jewish in Europe in in Ukraine, but non in not in aging. She's, she's, uh, there are no Azerbaijan. There are no there are no local people from Azerbaijan 
with a similar genetic code, with a similar genetic yes, screen. Yes, the Zadjabian the, the, right. the is not similar to, 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 to the genetic uh, European. Right, I understand. So this is a good example of someone who's not in an exclusive group, but the story, the bigger picture, the circumstances can also help us. And do the basin yes. accept it? Yeah, the ah, accepted. They the accepted, accepted it, and, and they yes. and they allowed her to get married, or whatever they allowed her to. She was to, married uh, already, but but uh, she, she she had she had some problem, and she, uh, they accepted, yeah. Mm -hmm. They accepted it. Me meaning, uh, t tell me something maybe more more generally. This type of uh, evidence, what they did in 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 Eretz Israel, around the world, has this become? common? Has this become widely accepted? You know, I imagine that in the beginning people were suspicious. Uh, people thought this is, um, this is new. This is kind of a change in the way that we're going to Paskan, uh, the halacha. Mm. This is not traditional. Um, what's the situation today? Has this become accepted the, and, and, and widespread? Mm -hmm. The first basin uh, that accepted this, the, this evidence is a basin in Moscow. My friend uh, Rabbi uh, Israel Berenbaum is the first one. Mm -hmm. He's an expert in the, this subject. And uh, he used with it a few years ago already. And, uh, and then, uh, two years ago, I think. Right, I should, mention, I should mention that you wrote a book together with Rabbi Berenbaum, correct? Yes. That's a joint book that you wrote on this yes. subject. So here's what on, the first reason to do this. And which year? Yes. Which year was this? How long ago was this? Pardon? How long ago? How many years ago was this decision uh, on, on his basis? Uh, he started already, I think, um, uh, four years ago. Maybe four maybe. years ago. So it's still very about, new. Okay, about, four years ago. Yes. Okay. About. And from that, step, um, uh, I think the last the, the last year here in in uh, in, in Israel, but and all, uh, also the uh, 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 rabbis in uh, all over the world started slowly to to uh, to use with this uh, evidence, this, uh, the genetic testing, and uh, it goes slowly. Uh, these uh, dynamics are accepted. Uh, these. Uh, mm -hmm. And they think that not, but they don't say they don't want to accept it. They, 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 they don't send the people to, to, uh, to testing. They don't send people for testing. And if it yeah. is, if there's the honor that don't send people for testing, if they would do the testing by themselves, then if you had pushed them into the corner, you think they would accept it or they still wouldn't accept it? Look here, a panel of, 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 of the uh, um, has got a case uh, in front of them, and uh, after, uh, after we, uh, to, uh, to give a decision if uh, they are Jewish or not, um, uh, and, and they are stuck. They don't know what, 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 what to say, what, what to, uh, which the decision to give. Uh, I think they will use it, yeah, because the document is not. No, good because you're saying they're looking, they're looking for a solution, and you're really offering them a solution. You're giving them, hey. Look at this evidence. This is a, it, it, it's a rive, it's a simon, it's, a, it, it's something which you can't, you can't ignore this. It's something which is significant. So, so why, why do some Dayanis yes, still, uh, uh, you know, why are they still reluctant? Why are they still, uh, why do they treat it still with suspicion? Just because it's new and it's hard to get used to it? Or because exactly, there's a real argument? Exactly. I, did, I, did, I, did, I did not hear a, a, a good reason to uh, why they don't accept it. It's new and it doesn't doesn't know it doesn't understand it enough, and uh, because mm -hmm. of that, they, they, they don't send the people to to generic testing. But if we, mm -hmm. some somebody will come to me and and I will make him test, uh, and the the results will be uh, very good, very very clear. So I I will go to the basin and explain them. Mm -hmm. And tell me in terms of in terms of Kedele Israel. You know, at the end of the day, many of these Dayanim will be looking to the Gedolea praise game, the, 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 you know, the really, the leading Dayanim, the leading praise game. Are there any among the, you know, the, the real Gedolea Hadar who, are, have, who have endorsed, who have given their signatures to this kind of uh, uh, genetic testing, to this kind of evidence? 
Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the boss of ice uh, is uh, under the, the this uh, uh, um, uh, Simanim Institute. It is under the uh, 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 and also. Uh, you, you um, mean Rabasha Rabasha Shlita, who is of course one of the uh, daily place game. In your shanaim, he he's fully he stands, be, he stands behind he, behind our institute. He yes. stands behind it. Yeah. Okay. Meaning, and everything and, that you've done is also together with him. He's he's behind uh, everything that, that that you're doing in not, Germany. Not 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 every case, yeah, but uh, but uh, but I'm speaking with a, a, the principal, a the the baby yes, principal. Yes, okay. Sure, yeah. So that's that. And and we have ever asked on 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 the book from Rabbi Daniel Chaim Goldberg and the chief Rabbi Rabbi David Lau and Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, so also um, mm-hmm. gave us comments that uh, you can rely on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 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 they're but they're not as involved as Rabbi Meaning they gave us Kama, but but the yes, but the, the, yes, the but, leading but, but, authority but, but, that's really involved is is a going Rabbi Shavai. On on the institute, uh, uh, um, the 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 God the, the, the stand behind us. It's a boss of us, yeah. And uh, and and I I assume that you 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 would imagine that the more that this becomes well known, the more that this becomes available uh, to people, both people in general and and the Yanim, uh, will start using it more. Um, yes, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm but, sure. Right. The, 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 number the, 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 one. Okay, yes. How do how do you see this being expanded? How do you see this becoming? Um, uh, what, you know, what what kind of uses we we use it? You're saying we can use it today for checking, um, you know, somebody who claims to be Jewish, and we have a suffix, We have some element of doubt about whether it's true or not true. Um, you know, many people, for example, from the former Soviet Union, from Russia, Ukraine, and, and so on. Um, how do you see this becoming more, um, more more common, more mainstream? What kind of cases, what kind of because, questions? Because, how else how do you see this? Because there is a lot, a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people in the, in the last hundred, hundred years uh, that uh, were married and non-Jewish, and you can't know today if, if they are Jewish or not. So um, uh, from Russia, you, you can have uh, documents uh, sometimes, but sometimes not. And um, from, mm-hmm. from America, I don't, I don't know if there is documents at all. Uh, from Europe, I don't know if there is documents at all. So we have, you, have, you, have mm-hmm. to, you have to give a, a, um, a, they, they haven't got uh, any investment. Do you think we'll find more groups? We'll, we'll find more kind of more specific groups that will be able to help more and more people that today we're still unable to help? Uh, if you ask, if you find more groups, I think uh, one group uh, um, I'm sure that we will find because I can see it now. Uh, there's a, a big group that uh, now we can't say they are Jewish because there's a lot of non-Jewish and we have to find where the difference from the, uh, the Jewish group. Um, and mm-hmm. from in this group, uh, for the, from the Jewish to the, uh, to the non-Jewish in this group. Right, I mean, we have, the, a, we have a big group. What, what, what percentage is, is this big group? How, much, how many? What's the percentage? I think it's uh, 7.5% uh, from the Ashkenazi wow. population. So this is like a 7.5% of Ashkenazi Jews is in a group, and this group is still not exclusive enough because we have non-Jews that loads, are also part of the group. Loads of non-Jews in Europe, yeah. yeah, yeah millions of non-Jews of, in Europe. Millions in of non-Jews. But you're saying yes. if we can sharpen that, then how can we sharpen it? By doing better testing, by, by having a, um, a, a greater, uh, yeah, a, a, more, now, a, more, a higher resolution analysis in the, in the mitochondrial DNA. If we yes, like to take the whole now, mitochondrial but, DNA instead of taking part of it. Yes, now we're testing just, just a small part of the mitochondrial DNA. And uh, we, have to, we have to make uh, research to, uh, on the, all the mitochondrial DNA to find the difference. Uh-huh. So even this group, you think, will be able to help a lot so of this people group once is, we define it better. Yes, this group, I'm sure that, that we will find it. And, uh, and Dr. Doran Bauer also told me that in this group, uh, we will find the difference from the Jewish uh, to the non-Jewish. 
But these, but these more uh, small groups uh, or, or very small groups that isn't uh, at all in the non-Jewish and uh, we'll find in the Jewish. So uh, it can be, uh, uh, I don't know if it will be 100% that they are Jewish, but uh, if we find uh, five people, four people, uh, Jewish people that uh, in, in the same in the same uh, uh, group, small group. And another one, and we'll find uh, exactly like, like them. So I think is a, is a, is a good uh, evidence. All right. Now I, I just want you to clarify something um, because we, we didn't we didn't speak out this point before. But let, let us make it clear. What what I understand that if you find, let's say someone comes in, he wants to have a test, and we find that he's part of one of these big groups, so we say, okay, we know that he's Jewish or that he's very likely to be Jewish. Now, if we find that he doesn't fit any group, he's just not nothing. He's a group of, you know, a well-known non-Jewish uh, DNA strand. Um, so he doesn't have any any Jewish DNA in him. Does this we mean so we that he should we worry? No, that doesn't mean to worry because there's a lot of people that there are, that are uh, very small uh, groups and in database you can't you can't uh, you can't find like this like this. But we just can't find it. Meaning this could be someone who converted or somebody that didn't have many children or you know it's yes. impossible to yes. know. But it doesn't mean anything at all about his you know Jewish. Yes, there, uh, there's no real Jewish DNA. We we can't say this is Jewish DNA and no, this is no, non-Jewish no, no, DNA. No, 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 no. You can't say. But but you have to realize that the, now nowadays the, the the Jewish database is quite small, so so you, you can't cover all, all the Jewish population. Mm-hmm. All right, meaning as the database will grow, we'll be able to map out the mm-hmm. the, the yeah, Jewish to, people in a much mm-hmm. to, to right, make in more in a much better yeah. way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now now what we I understood one one just one one more question, Rabbi Litka. Um there seems to be a very big difference in terms of the DNA mapping between the Ashkenazi jury and the Sadi jury. And, and the question is, um, is that because we haven't done enough research maybe on the Sadi Jews? Um, or, or, or is it because of something more, more, more basic? Some, you know, what, what, what does this tell us exactly about the differences between the Ashkenazi and the Sadi uh, jury, because um, uh, Dr. Kami mentioned that these big, big groups we found only among the Ashkenazi Jews. It means that we, it will be much more yes, but, much but, harder but, but, for us, much more difficult to help somebody who's coming from uh, the Saudi world to prove his Jewish descent, his Jewish uh, uh, ancestry. Mm-hmm. Yes, but so so uh, uh, big groups uh, uh, we can't see in the in the Saudi population in Saudi Jewish. Um, but uh, but uh, these small groups we can see over there, and and the and the database of the Saudi population is uh, very small. And I think uh, from um, um, North Africa it is uh, maybe three four hundred. It's not enough. It's not oh, enough. Very small. oh, it's really it's small. small. Yeah, yeah. In in mm-hmm. Iran, I think it's um, uh, eighty or about eighty ninety. In uh, Iraq, um, I think uh, about 200. Hmm. It's not enough. It's not so enough. You think most, of, most of the research, like the, the great majority of the research that's been done, is among Ashkenazi Jews, not among Saudi Jews. Yes, because they, they looked for, for the big groups. Hmm. They, they looked for the big groups and, and they didn't find it in the Ashkenazi, in the, in the Jewish uh, uh, Saudi. So they went to the so, so, um, and did it in the Ashkenazi population. Mm-hmm. That means that there's a lot, a lot more work, a lot more work to be done. Yes, exactly. Okay, Rabbi Litka, thank you very, very much for being with us. You know, clarifying this is, you know, it must be exciting to be a part of this because it's you know something which is so new and and you know taking halacha to, you know, places that that uh, you know. In, in the past, we haven't had the tools to deal with these kind of halachic dilemmas, and this is a new tool that's you know fallen into into your hands from from the research. You know, it must be very exciting to be a part of it. Yes, yes, uh, <laughs> you're right. Uh, it's very nice, and I love it. 
Great. Uh, Rabbi Litke, again, thank you very much for being with us. Wishing you much, much hatzlacha in, uh, in the future and, uh, you know, do, do wonderful things for Klali Thank you very much. Well, Amen. Thank you. All the best, Carlton. So we're, we're privileged uh, and honored to have on the show today Rav Yehuram Oman. Rav Oman is the Rosh based in of Sydney, Australia, uh, and he's also one of the uh, leading figures in the application of genetic research to halachic fields, um, and we're going to uh, tap in on, on real, a real wealth of experience and wisdom in this field. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Harav Ullman. Good morning. Shalom Aleichem. Uh, aleichem and Shalom, and really thank you again for uh, uh, taking the time for being on the show. Um, and, and maybe we'll just open uh, as a kind of open-ended question to uh, bring us into this field. Um, you know, m- many listeners won't be familiar with the halachic implications of genetic research. Uh, how old is this field? Where did it begin from? Um, g- give, us the, give us the main station that this field has gone through and up to the kind of cutting edge uh, place where it is today. Um, wh- where did this begin and, and where is it getting to? Well, um, the, the question of using some sort of um, uh, genetic um, genetic proof in order to be able to impact halacha was something that was discussed as far as Rav Sadia Goyen um, and throughout the ages it was touched upon, obviously in a very, very mm-hmm. simple way, even there's a, a Rashash who spoke about it. But in, in more recent times, uh, there was a lot of discussion of using DNA for all different types of halachic um, investigations and uh, certifications. For example, in, in the, the time of the Goyen, sorry for interrupting, but just in the time of the Goyen and the Rashash, what kind of of genetic conception did they have? In which sense was this uh, was this mentioned? The, they were discussed about using, for example, blood to, ident- to identify, uh, to bring some kind of identifications. There was mm. no concept of DNA in those days. But there was identifying through blood. Okay. Okay. And, so this uh, is like a, a primordial concept of what we're doing today. Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, right. DNA itself was um, used in questions of uh, heteragonies. For example, mm-hmm. uh, September 11th, when tragically, you know, quite a number of, of um, men have perished without any trace, um, there was a much work being done in order to be able to matter Agunis based on DNA. And uh, quite a few of the world poskim were involved in that particular field. Um, today, it's being very much used in order to be able to connect a father and a son, um, close relatives, uh, there was much discussion whether or not um, DNA should be used in Shilas of Mamzerus. And the consensus right. of Poskim is not to use DNA to pass all the many reasons for it, but not to use it mm-hmm. uh, whenever you have all of the other reasons to be able to matter a person from the stigma of Mamzerus. It was uh, the consensus mm-hmm. is not to be able to bring in uh, DNA not in order to be, to be able to. Correct. Because of concerns so, of things that it might raise and, and it might raise, um, you know, you might solve one problem but create a different problem. Correct. Correct. Right. And uh, those questions are being discussed. But more recently, um, more of a cutting edge scientific uh, research um, in connection to halacha was uh, specifically with biruriados, which means to be able to uh, help and certify Jewish status using DNA. And uh, obviously, um, regular DNA was, is not, uh, is not uh, valid uh, to identify uh, Jewish status because every single person is made up of his mother and his father, and the mother is also a product of her father and her mother, you know, all the way sure. to the end of times, to the beginning of times. And as a result, you know, today a person could be, you know, with the regular DNAs, the DNA tests we have on, on Lyon, for example, a person could be, uh, could come up with the results of 97% Ashkenazi Jew and halakhically maybe non-Jewish because it has nothing to do with his maternal line. 
And the exception right. is what's called the mit- mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria is a very minuscule part of a of a female uh, egg. Just to give you an example, a female egg could be over 3 billion um, letters of DNA, and mitochondria is just over 16,000 letters. It's a very, very tiny part of the um, of, a, of, of the of the DNA. The DNA and, strand, only, right. and while it's passed to males and females, but it goes further only from females. With males are self-destructive, so therefore only a female will pass on the mitochondria to her offsprings. And therefore, in theory, mm-hmm. if you would then connect a person to uh, some woman who lived a thousand years ago, if you could do that, in theory that person, and, and that woman is Jewish, so in theory that person also would be Jewish because there's no male interference. There's no interference of ma- in, male DNA, right. only female DNA. And as a result... In, in that code. Okay. And that research, uh, obviously, potentially, in theory, could impact and could assist in helping to identify Jewish status. The question is, number one, how, you know, and second of all, how much prior uh, evidence of Jewishness you need in order to be able to seal uh, the person's status as a Jew. And that is the research mm-hmm. that's being done recently, in recent times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and may, maybe just, uh, you know, bring, bring, bring us, uh, myself and the listeners, bring us into this a little bit more. Wh- which, which concrete cases have you been involved with in which this kind of, you know, DNA research, um, genetic research based on mitochondrial DNA has been instructive in bringing the case to a, to a positive conclusion? Give us some examples if, if you well, have I'll some, share uh, two very interesting cases with you. Obviously, not every case has a... Uh, a okay. positive um, outcome. result because right. ultimately, the positive outcome because ultimately we know that um, the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, is um, is only used to be able to assist a person to uh, certify the Jewishness. It, it never comes to pass a person. The, the, recently, there was a lot of uh, debate because everything becomes political, unfortunately. And mm-hmm. when this particular research became known, for example, in Israel, a lot of opposition came out because claiming that somehow people are subjected uh, to, uh, to these tests. Another argument is that, you know, if you're going to start using this particular test, you will end up disqualifying people who were known to be Jewish, you know, for generations that somehow the DNA will disqualify them. And nothing could be further from the truth because, uh, because ultimately, what makes a person Jewish is the chazaka, is the knowledge that mother is Jewish, the grandmother is Jewish, and the fact that, that a particular person could be a very big uh, personality in Jewish world, uh, could be, his, his DNA is not the Jewish DNA, would not even to a smallest degree question the Jewishness. There could be many reasons why uh, the DNA is not typically Jewish. One reason could be that 2,000 years ago, in times of Chazal, there were a lot of uh, Geir Tzedek. There could have been a uh, one Geir that would seal the DNA not to be typically Jewish. Also, mm-hmm. we have to remember that when it comes, for example, how do we use uh, DNA to be able to help to, uh, to identify Jewish status is because of certain groups uh, were identified to be almost almost uh, exclusively Jewish. And there was, for example, the, the, you know, th- there's a, the famous four primordial mothers who were the, mm-hmm. the, the who began this, the Ashkenazi Jewry. And close to 50% of Ashkenazi Jews are matched to one of the four mothers. And what about the mm-hmm. other 50%? The other 50% could, could be part of small groups which haven't been researched yet or... Uh, that, that could be also uh, descendants of righteous converts. And therefore, there's no danger whatsoever that the will somehow uh, cast aspersion on the Jewishness of anybody. It's only being used to... Right, meaning you're, you're saying there's no, there's, there's no real Jewish DNA, as it were. We, we have groups of Jews that share similar strands of DNA, but that doesn't imply anything about those who don't. Either it hasn't been researched or it's something which is um, the product of, you know, some mothers were more successful in 
reproducing in 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 having a, a huge lineage progeny and and some were i guess less successful but it it, it doesn't bear it doesn't have any bearing on a person's exactly uh, jewish exactly. credentials right exactly so that's very important to be able to preface with that because there's no downside of researching and applying this and trying to apply this to assist people because it'll never become a, a negative factor, only a positive factor. Right. So at, at the same to... time, and, 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 and uh, you mentioned that there are some people outside of the uh, halachic world who have objections because perhaps they don't understand the way it works exactly. Are there people within the halachic world that have objections to the use of, of, of genetic testing for, uh, w- within the halachic uh, realm? Like everything else, there were Rabbonim and Poskim who objected. I think that in the last year or so, there was a lot of move towards realizing the benefits of it, provided that it's used within the context of halacha. It's very dangerous if it's going to be used just uh, with hafkeiros, with by people who don't understand how to apply it to halacha. But if it's used within Botedin, within the world of Poskim, then it will be used correctly in the right mm-hmm. context and together with the other evidence uh, to be able to assist uh, mm-hmm. many people who m- may come from certain countries where they're lacking uh, chazoka, lacking documentation, lacking other evidence, and they, they want to be able to prove the Jewishness. Ultimately, today, we know that in um, organized communities, whenever somebody, for example, is getting married in America, it's less organized because there's no central botedin that are exclusive to a particular city. Sometimes maybe certain cities have it, but it's not the same as in England, for example, or in Sydney, Australia, or in South Africa, or in Eretz Yisrael. But there's a system. When somebody wants to get married, it's not just an individual row that decides to marry a couple. It has to go through a central system of mumchim to be able to to um, to do a, what's called a birur yuchsin, which means a clarification right. of the status, not just Jewish status, but other questions, questions of kahuna, Questions in the other, there are certain questions of, of uh, incompatibilities. There could be two, you know, the color could be Jewish. That's of right. Course. And uh, of like everything else, DNA is only one particular factor that could be used, one and factor. it has to be used correctly. Right. So, so the, the chashash you're saying, the, the the reason why people treat it maybe with suspicion or reluctance is because of a concern this might turn into the Wild West because anybody can do DNA testing, meaning. People don't have the kalim. People don't have the general halachic tools to deal with 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 Rov and chazaka and the other uh, traditional uh, uh, halachic mechanisms. But DNA testing, you know, and anyone can open some kind of a you know institute for DNA testing and and do it. So, and, and the way that we deal with that concern is by saying this has to be within the auspices of a recognized basin. You know, there's no way we could allow this to be done outside of a basin setting. Correct. Another concern which was raised by Sam Poskin was what is the what is the source in Shas and Poskin because everything has to have a particular source. Whenever we apply right. a, a new technology, a new method, right. in halacha, there has to be more than just a scientific argument to be able to apply it. Right. Needs to have a framework. Needs to have a framework, a halachic framework that would feeding this new. Uh, this new evidence, right? This this new mechanism within. So, what is the halachic framework that you generally use? So, I'll uh, I'll touch upon it, you know, within the context of those two cases that you asked. You know, yeah. Let let let's go. Let's go ahead with the anecdotes with the, with the, with the case with the concrete cases, and let's see how how they were resolved. And I'll be happy to right. hear. So, okay. uh, I'll share with you one very interesting case because this, I believe, this case in a way was very very. Um, uh, almost like a turning point within the research because a lot of the research was done on uh, individuals that there was almost a predictable outcome. In order to be able to advance right. the research, you have to do you have to test a lot of people who are probably Jewish, either already are Jewish, are certified Jewish, or a very high probability of being Jewish, as well as non-Jews, because the only way that you that you can identify a group. That is exclusively, almost, almost exclusively Jewish, is by also ruling out that there are non Jews that have that, that particular DNA. And of the same strand, right? And therefore, the, uh, you know, a lot of research has to be done on both Jews and, and, and non Jews alike. Um, mm-hmm. So, I was b- b- because of my involvement in a section of halacha that applies to Evan Ezer. 
which is a part of Shulchan Aruch that deals with anything to do with marriage, divorce, and everything in between. Sure. Uh, so we, you know, we're involved with Poskim um, Rabbonim around the world, and we share information. Specifically, there's a, a rabbi in in Russia called Rabbi Yisrael Birenboim, who is a member of the Beth Din of Moscow, that mm-hmm. is very was very much involved in together with the scientists in the advancement of the study of mitochondrial DNA. And um, in, in Eretz Yisrael, I have a very good friend called Rabbi Zev Litke. Sure. And, um, and we were always in touch about um, uh, sharing different questions of uh, Shiloh's uh, insights, and so forth. experiences, yeah, insights. of course. And um, I was invited to come to a, a very small almost like a mini conference in Eretz Yisrael in the end of, of 2016, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, attended by a few Rabbonim together with Harav Zalman Nechem Goldberg, Mary Rabbi, who is, is a world of Pesach. Okay. Uh, the conference was hosted by Professor Steinberg. I'm sure you need an introduction on this, uh, on this forum. Course. No, all, very... all well-known figures. Yeah. In the world of halacha and science, uh, yeah, and a very close well. personal friend of mine, sure. and um, and uh, there were maybe five rabbonim and um, uh, three leading scientists in the field. Mm-hmm. And before that, a few months before that, I was contacted by a uh, a woman from the United States. I'm going to talk without identifying any possible. Connection to any information that could uh, break the anonymity of the people involved. So I'm going to just talk yeah. in general terms. There was a woman from a very, very hush of a rabbinic family in the United States. Okay. And she called me uh, because of my involvement in the area of Yuxin. She was directed to me to be able to assist her. And the question was that her brother um, unfortunately went off the derech. And in other words, he didn't uh, want to be from anymore. And uh, he moved to a small city in Northern Europe where he met with a a Polish Catholic lady and they got married and she's now pregnant with his child. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family sort of lost contact with him with the exception of that sister. And uh, in Mm -hmm. one particular conversation, with uh, her brother's wife, um, she, uh, the, the, the brother's wife told her that she has some Jewish connection in the family. There's some ancestor who is said to be, that there's a rumor or some kind of a, a talk within the family that they could be Jewish. And that obviously raised the antennas of the sister-in-law, and she started to ask him questions. And then right. she called me to, to ask me if I could do a a birur, some kind of of a, a, a yuchsin um, investigation to be able to see if there is, if we could establish the Jewish connection. Mm-hmm. And with the permission of the couple, I've started to discuss it, to, to talk about the facts and the evidence. And what came up was that that there is a um, um, great grandmother's mother. So the family itself comes from a city in Poland, and the great and the great grandmother's mother and her husband lived in Odessa, and they had quite a Jewish name. A name that could be, you know, certain names are very non-Jewish. Certain surnames are very non not Jewish surnames, right. and some names are um, poss- some names are Shemus Mufhokim. If you have a name like a Cohen or Levy, Cohen, or Levy. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's not a full proof because you can have a non-Jewish coin also. But some names are right. more what's called Shemus Muvhokim. You have the same right. consideration of certain first names too. For example, in Russia, certain first names were identifiably Jewish, and some names are very non-Jewish. Right. So while right. it's not a full proof, but it definitely could be used as a very strong sniff in in the bureau of uh, Jewish status. So that particular it's a good name indication. Was, not a proof, but an indication. Sorry, okay. very strong and and. The degrees of, of, of how strong the indication is. And you have to know, for example, a name like um, Hoffman or, 
or Greenberg and Goldman in Germany, it very well may be a non-Jewish person. But in Eastern hmm. Europe, it was exclusively a Jewish name. All right. So the circumstances are always important. Okay. Correct. So a name like Robinson, for example, in England, it's a regular right. English name. But right. in uh, Eastern Europe, it was a very Jewish name. So that particular ancestor, or you know, both a great great grandfather and great great grandmother, had quite a Jewish name, both first names and last names. Okay. And uh, I created a what's called a tick a file, a case file, and I asked to to get maternal documents connecting the wife of that particular gentleman, you know, with her mother, grandmother, great grandmother, until that particular ancestor and we also collected some other circumstantial evidence connected with what the neighbors have spoken about for example there was one mm-hmm. particular neighbor that uh, said that um, the great grandmother and her daughter moved to the polish city they were known to the to the neighbors to be jewish but they weren't given over to the nazis because they liked them and there was some other mm-hmm. evidence which were collected, but nothing was... So they were glying, what we would call in Halakha, Raglaim the Dover. There was a communication, exactly. but Ladova. not enough exactly. to, to define a, to exactly. prove a, a Judaism. Okay. Exactly. So I told the, 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 the sister-in-law from America that I'm going to add this role to this particular conference. When I come back, I'll see maybe uh, her sister-in-law is a candidate for the for mitochondrial test. And right. in Eretz role, we had a very interesting discussion. First, we heard from the scientists about the genetic and statistical evidence um, of those groups that are exclusively, virtually exclusively Jewish. And we had a discussion to what extent we can apply it and what sort of a over you need in order to be able to uh, to create a Makiba Patish to seal that particular uh, case or that particular identity. Right. And uh, when I came back to Australia, I have suggested that there should be uh, a test. I told them that it's very, very new in the field of halacha, and therefore I told them that they shouldn't think that if it comes out positive, therefore automatically will certify uh, her sister-in-law as being Jewish. But I said it'll go a long way, and um, I recommended it. Anything that, uh, any sort of uh, scientific process that is used to... Um, uh, sort of our Jewishness has to be done with a under hashgacha. We used, for right. example, you know, I'm very much involved in the field of fertility, uh, and the clinics that are under my supervision, they always have hashgacha to the extent that the genetic material always has to be either supervised or sealed with the proper chaysim in incubators or so, uh, natural tanks. Need the proper support. supervision, proper pikuach, of course. Correct. So over here. We're to be able to make sure that, that the test is being done under Ashgoche. And I've asked my friend, Rabbi, Rabbi Burenbaum, who is both a Mumche and also geographically closer to that place in Northern Europe than Australia, to be able to travel to that city and to uh, supervise <coughs> the uh, taking of the, of, the, of the DNA samples. Today it's a very simple saliva right. test. You don't have to do any more blood tests. Okay. And by the time he was able to go there, it was a day before Erevim Kippur. Uh, Tovshin Ein Zayn, and uh, he and uh, she gave birth to a baby girl just a day before. Mm. Uh, okay. But uh, you know there was no problem with doing a test, and he took it back to Moscow. He has a lab there that he works with, and uh, it took some time. Today it's much quicker. And uh, but it came out that she was matched to one of the four mothers. One of the big groups. Right. One of the so one, one of these big groups means almost 100 percent bad a Jewish. Correct. Uh, statistically and right. genetically, it would mean virtually 100 percent a Jewish. Right. So at that time, I've written a, a tshuva, which was subsequently printed in in uh, some publications. The uh, after mm-hmm. the conference, the, uh, there's a book came out called the Ruriados, which was put together by Rav Birnbaum and Rav Litka. Uh, Rav Litka and, and Birnbaum show. Sure. I, I've had, yeah, I have together to with, with a few other uh, input from scientists and, and Rabonim. And there was debate right. in, in the book, you know, that there was some Rabonim wrote sort of against using that particular, unless uh, there's, a, you know, almost a full... Other other side. Right. Yeah. Right. See, my tshuva, I've discussed generally the, the topics uh, uh, of 
how do you identify Jewishness? You, you, first of all, how what is the place? Right. On one hand, but we have in, all in the this methods. Shiva, in, in this shiva, yeah. you would argue that the genetic testing itself, by itself, would be sufficient to be matter. To no, be, to be in, in that to shiva, I wrote there has to be there has to be a glamour That's what I wrote in the and, uh, shiva. And that's together with it. Uh-huh. Together with it. And, it, and I, again, and you, you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I, I very briefly touched upon the place. You know, on one hand, we have all the methods used by Chazal. Right. to be able to identify any sort of status. On the other hand, what is the place of practical, scientific, or um, or other evidential evidence, uh, you know, evidence to be used um, to, to certify anything, for example, documents or uh, or, or uh, other uh, evidence of uh, Jewish practice and so on, so Jewish names, and I've analyzed what is the place of all, these, of all of these methods uh, to identify a Jewish status. And uh, as far right. as the mitochondrial DNA, in my opinion, the, the strongest argument from Chazal and from uh, Poskim is the question of Simon Muvak, which is used for Agunas. It's also used for Shavas Aveda in Baba Metzir. But to, to me, the, the greatest comparison is in the laws of Agunas, where you have a situation mm-hmm. where a, there's a body. We know that when a woman is married, the only thing that can free her is either death of a husband or a get and uh, there's a very large section in in, uh, in Gemara it's in Gemara Yivam it's mainly but in Shulchan Aruch it's in Simon Yudzayin and Ebenezer which is one of the largest simonim in Shulchan Aruch itself yeah. which talks about different ways and means to be able to free a woman from status of being married from being Ish Ish right. to being a Tnuya right. Right, so we need and, to identify uh, the, the corpse by means of a simon mivak, of a, of a correct. clear, it could be a mole on the side of his nose or whatever it is, something which is a simon mivak, and that's enough to be matter and ish So that's right, and, so the question and your is, argument it, it, here could be be, a, it, it could either be sorry, a um, many simonim bainanim, for example, it could be many average ah. simonim, or even ah. one simon mivak, and simon mivak ah. has to be identified, what is it? And it's discussed in the in uh, in in uh, uh, there's a commentary of Beishmul that talks about it at great length. And Oitzar Poskim to bring numerous chuvas discussing what is the level of that particular simon, uh, which can change the chazaka, can change the the legal presumption of being an ashes ish to becoming a, a pnuya to be not married anymore. And um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the the statistical consensus is that. Echod me'elef, one in a thousand. Now, if it's, like you said before, if it's a very common simon, that every ten people would have it, that's not enough to be a simon muvuk, to be a simon of the highest caliber. It has to be mm-hmm. a, a, a simon that virtually is you can, it's one in a thousand. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, it's a very, very strong connection, both in the level of a simon, as well as the severity of changing the chazaka. Because there's very few things that, of, of the... Uh, the importance within uh, halachic uh, ramifications and consequences, then the change of chazaka from a married woman to an, a single woman, to a woman who is not married anymore, who is free to get married, and from being non-Jewish to be, to, to be, to be considered to be Jewish. Sure. And um, what I wrote in that particular tshuva, that uh, you know, if the statistical and genetic um, um, argument is what it is, and it seems to be the fact. I mean, mm-hmm. there was so many deaths being done that that, yeah. that this is even matched. a kavachayma. You, you would say this is even a kavachayma, right? That if if we if if one in a thousand is enough to be matter and ish, the kavachayma, we could use the DNA I mean, evidence. More. Correct. For yeah, for right, stronger. but 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 I, I mean, this is this would require a, a, a you know a real statistician to be able to figure out the exact. Um, uh, you know the, the the statistical element of it. So, do you work with with statisticians that, that figure out the exact um, yeah, 100%. Uh, I, I, probabilities and so on? I made it very clear that I'm so neither on. a geneticist nor a statistician. I'm only working okay. in the areas, of, you know, in my capacity of, of uh, with halachic shilas. But we, uh, you know, in in, uh, in this particular book, Biriyados, uh, those questions are covered at great great depth and and mm-hmm. breadth. The question of of uh, 
the statistical and genetic application to it. And all the evidence, evidence points out to be that those groups that were identified are virtually exclusively uh, Jewish. Mm. Um, right. In other words, there's, there's virtually yeah, meaning, no, meaning no we Jews. would be able, right. On the, no, point, no, the somebody... question that came up in, in, in our discussions, what do we do with a, uh, a non-Jewish person who never had a chazoka of being Jewish that suddenly is identified to one of the four groups? You know, and, and in my opinion, uh, at this particular stage, it's not enough to be able to change the chazoka because you need some other evidence uh, to be able to uh, put together with it. But uh, from, from the point of view of the scientists, he's Jewish, that mm. particular person, because they haven't found, you know, um, to them, those groups are virtually exclusively Jewish. Now, when I, I wrote this right. tshuva, I, uh, there yeah. was discussion among other poskim who felt that it wasn't enough to be able to, uh, there was one major Pesach who wrote a counter tshuva to be able to say that uh, uh-huh. mitochondrial DNA is not enough. I felt there was also quite enough evidence together with the mitochondrial, the, the DNA argument, but um, it wasn't uh, accepted at, at that particular point. Uh-huh. And uh, what I told the family was that uh, they should wait. At this point, I would consider uh-huh. her Jewish, in my, in my opinion, and I think the family uh-huh. should treat her as Jewish. But it'll take some time. Today, things move much faster than they used to. Okay. Uh, and okay. I told them to, to, to wait a little bit. And uh, the father of the boy contacted me, and he said that, you know, he, he wants to wait until I will, I will put a, um, an actual psak what's called uh, Ishur Yados. At the moment, he felt... Okay, a, you know, a when I explained from your him, basement. Okay. Yeah, he said that he would trust my basement. He doesn't need anything else, but he said that at the moment, okay. uh, Machua was more lahaloch, not lamaisa. I didn't yet write a proper Ishur, as they say. I only wrote uh-huh. an argument saying, in my opinion, that, you know, that's the case. Um, uh-huh. and, 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 you know, our policy in our business, whenever we write any psak that is Nogel Adoiris. We're not, you know, if Paskin or Shailen you're there in the Suba right. we can pass right. on the telephone. Really Anything to do with them okay. it's yeah. going to be Chav, and always yeah. with its Tarfus of at least, depending on how controversial the case is, at least with two or more right. uh, Paskim that, that are among him in this area. And um, okay. so we left it at, at, at that, but um, what happened was that uh, a few months after that, it was El Tovshin Ein Zayn, the sister-in-law, who I encouraged because she's very, very good in, in, in researching on the internet, different files and different uh, mm-hmm. databases and so on and so forth, she came across a whole um, uh, reshima of a uh, Jewish community in Odessa from that time. Mm-hmm. And she found this particular great-great-grandmother and great-great-grandfather listed as part of the Jewish community. And we only knew, you know, we had a bit of evidence, um, also circumstantial evidence dealing with, you know, with the maiden name and with some of the children. We knew that she had seven children. We only knew the names of two of them, one of them being mm-hmm. the great-grandmother of the lady we're talking about. But she found right. uh, with the other kids with names like uh, Shmuel Yasef and, um, uh-huh. and, and, and really names which, which are only Jewish and, and, and you, you couldn't find, uh, right. you know. Meaning clear, uh, right, clear indication to the Judaism of a family. And, 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 and that confirmation of a maiden name the, and other evidence. Uh-huh. Sorry, what did you say? Okay. What? And and this was convincing, meaning this was this reinforced your position. Reinforced. I wrote a second shuva, uh, and I, uh, followed by a psak, official psak from my Besden, which was signed by five uh, mumchim in this area, including mm. uh, poskim like Rabbi Osher Weiss, uh, okay. Chief Rabbi Lau. He co-signed with me nice. on a particular sack, certifying her being Jewish, right. including Rabbi Birenbaum, including Rabbi Litke. Nice. And, um, right. and, this, and then, this and then the, other, the other Dayanim who originally rejected it or objected to it, they fell into line after that. Yeah, it's, today, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's interesting how in such a short time, how much this particular mm-hmm. method is being used, obviously, in the right context. And, you know, as we said before, uh, but it's, it's be, started to be used in Botedin. Hmm. Uh, there was one particular case, and, I thought, and this case was quite uh, unusual because it started off with a woman who had no prior chazaka at all, and the test was done before any uh, confirming evidence. 
and all the evidence mm. came out. So why, why, why was it? Why was the test? Why was the test done? No, I'm talking about this particular case. I'm talking about and my the case, case that you mentioned before. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another case which I briefly will mention. There was a case which. Um, uh, from uh, also one of the cities in America, a gentleman, a, a religious, a from uh, Jewish person contacted me, uh, and he was yeah. basically plagued with doubts. He was adopted, okay. and uh, uh, and he was told by uh, the agency that the parents are Jewish. He made his own personal research, and he confirmed the Jewishness of the father, but he couldn't get to mm -hmm. the bottom of the mother. He found some evidence, but not to him it wasn't conclusive. <clears throat> Again, mm -hmm. it was it wasn't something that he was forced to do. He wasn't getting married. He wasn't um, he had no agenda. It was purely a personal desire mm -hmm. to live without any doubts of his status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I looked, to know who you are, he wanted to find out who am I really. Correct. Okay. And uh, when I looked at the evidence, I saw that really he went as far as he could. There's nothing else we could look for to be able to find any uh -huh. further on his mother's he side. He turned over all the stones that he could turn over. All right. Correct. And that I, I suggested to him um, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which he gladly accepted. Right. And uh, we sent right. him to Merit Rav Ravlitka sent him the, you know, all, all the, uh, the Kalim needed to be able to, uh, to be tested. And he sent it back to the lab. You know, we sent it back to the lab in Merit Yisrael. Right. And again, he was the largest. He, he was matched to the largest of the four groups. He was in the big group. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, Very nice. Really, yeah. mm -hmm. Very nice. Tell me, you know, just uh, uh, I'm sure we could speak for a very long time, but tell me just um, um, you know, briefly, how do you see this continually developing? You know, you, you've seen this developing over the past, you know, just short time. And like you said, it's become... Um, you know, far more accepted. It's become something which um, you know many Dayanim would would probably think about uh, when they have a case of of Biruri Yadis. Um, how do you see this developing in 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 the forthcoming future in terms of the research, in terms of the uh, future development, in terms of the halacha, in terms of the types of questions? Where do you see it going? It can only go in, in a in a positive direction as long as it's being used. Mm -hmm. I mean, the research is in full swing. And as the research will advance, more and more groups will be identified as being exclusively Jewish. Right now, they're coming across certain groups that are larger groups that are, on one hand, there are many Jews uh, matched to the particular group, but also very many non-Jews. So you cannot, at this particular point, um, certify anybody, even with right. minimal reglam ledover, as we say. But as the research will advance, more and more groups will be identified. And again, as mm -hmm. long as it's being used in responsible hands by Poskim mm -hmm. and uh, Anshe Halacha and Botedin, uh, it can only be used for the benefit of the Jewish people to, to the system, and not as some people mm -hmm. try to suggest in order to be able to somehow become, you know, the, 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 the KGB and and and, <laughs> and, and, and start, uh, you know, imposing certain tests on people. It's only being used uh, for the benefit of people who are struggling to be able to. Uh, prove the identity, which, mm -hmm. according to Allah, it has to be done today. We know that there's many, many poskim. It's a whole different subject. But ultimately, we know right. that the consensus of the poskis manenu is that, you know, when we have to be able to certify Jewishness, uh, especially among certain groups that don't have the chazaka or don't have the, the evidence, the documents. Um, and this can only be used to, to assist them. And as the science will be advanced, um, and as long as it's being in the hands of people who know how to use it in, in, within the context of halacha and within the context of other evidence, it's only going to be able to serve more and more the benefit of the Jewish people. Right, right. I, I was speaking to uh, Rabbi Lipka, who you mentioned before, and he, he thought perhaps this might even be used to identify some of the anusim of, uh, of Spain and Portugal, um, and, and, you know, that there must be hundreds and thousands of of Yidden yeah. who are lost in Spain and Portugal, and, and you know, given additional research and given additional um, uh, support from you know testing that we still haven't done, you know, who, the, the sky's the limit. On, on this, at the moment, you know, there are certain groups that are more easily identified. For example, we have the, as we said, Ashkenazi Jews, and some of the right. other groups, such as what's called the Mountain Jews or the Caucasian Jews, uh, right. they also have very very uh, strong. Um, 
point of identity how to be able to, to use the DNA to identify them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are other groups which at the moment uh, are on one hand very vague, on the, other, on the other hand there's a great need and a lot of requests to be able to assist. We get a lot of requests from, from Jews of Spanish origin claim, claiming to be Anusim and claiming to have certain Jewish huh. practice within the family. And at the moment the, the, the uh, results are very vague. But with time, mm-hmm. I think it will be able to be uh, – and sometimes, uh, you know, we still have to be able to go through a gear misophic, a gear l'chumra, two different concepts within gear to be able to – Right, although, uh, although you know, I, I'm sure that you also have uh, a certain preference not to have to go through the gear. It's, you know, it's, in, in many cases, a gear is, is a very difficult option. Uh, for sure, if the person is not completely being shemitah or mitzvah, um, and, and, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know if, if there would be a way of relying on the genetic testing so that you wouldn't need to do the Gil Khumra, that would be a, a great advantage, I would oh, imagine. 100%, without any doubt. Right. right. Um, Oman, a, a, a privilege for us to uh, have you on the show. Thank you very, very much for uh, honor and pleasure. sharing your insights and your experience. And I'm interested. I'm looking forward to uh, having you again. Yishakach. And much, 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 much